All right, we are live. We are live. Dr. Morris, lovely to have you on the show. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. It's been a long time since we've seen each other face to face. It has indeed. I just realized this recently because I was looking at your last name. <clears throat> I think I say Dr. Morris because I hear you say Dr. Morris or others say it. But I don't think as an Australian I would pronounce it Morris. It's Morse. Dr. Morse it's is Dr. what I'd Morse. say. Yeah, but Dr. Morse. But Morse sounds strange because I've always heard it said Morris. Morse. Morse. No, no. Morse. Like Morse code, yeah. not Morse, Dr. Morse the cat. I'm going to say Dr. Morse. Is that okay? Dr. Morse is good. It's like Savannah. You know, you Americans say Savannah. Savannah. I don't know how to say that as an what Australian. I guess I, I think, it, honestly, I think if it was a town in Australia, people would call it Savannah, I think. Because we don't have that long A on this, the second one, like Savannah. So I'm like, is it Savannah? Is it Savannah? <laughs> These things don't matter. Tomato, tomato, <laughs> yeah. Morse, like Morse code. Lovely. Diddy, 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 something like that. Put that in your mind. Rhymes with horse. I sometimes have to tell people that too. <laughs> well, it is an honor to have you on the show. I've really admired your work for a while. And I know the last time we met and chatted, I was just so edified by our conversation. I'm so grateful to have you on the show to bring your wisdom and insight and education and, you know, studies into this topic. Who are you, for those who are watching who may not know? Oh, okay. Well, I'm Dr. Jennifer Roback Morse. I'm founder and president of the Ruth Institute. Um, I started the Ruth Institute in 2008. Um, and when I founded it, I thought that what I was going to do is to talk to young women about why it would be okay for them to start their families um, and not worry about getting established in their careers and all of that, mm. so that you could start your family sometime before menopause. And uh, that that would be okay. That's what I thought I was going to do. But uh, in 2008 in San Diego, as you may remember, something big exploded on the scene, literally right when I started the Ruth Institute, and that was Proposition 8, um, and which was the California ballot initiative that uh, uh, amended the California Constitution to say marriage is a union of one man and one woman. Mm -hmm. By that time, I had written two books and had done a lot of research on why children need their parents and why, therefore, we need to be in favor of lifelong married love. And I had always assumed man and woman at that point when I was writing about that. But I could see that if you redefine marriage, you would end up redefining parenthood. And so, therefore, I didn't really want to deal with gay stuff, but I didn't feel I could sit it out. You know, I really felt I had to get involved with that based on the, all the knowledge that I already had and whatnot. So I got involved in that. I was associated with the National Organization for Marriage for a few years. Um, and that put me on the radar as somebody who's anti-gay. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, so, well, it's that's where we are ever since. And that that's all taken me into dealing with the whole of the sexual revolution and not just with uh, college-educated women trying to figure out what to do with themselves, which is a part of the mm. whole problem of the sexual revolution. But, you know, my scope now is... It's taken on a life of its own. Let's put it that way, Matt. So what sort of work do you do now, given that so-called gay marriage is legal in right. the United States right. and right. transgenderism is off to the races? Uh, transgenderism is a direct result of gay marriage. You know, I mean, if you hadn't redefined marriage already, if you hadn't got the, the social and legal things in place to allow that, um, I don't think transgenderism would have Why is the that? same steam. Well, you know, it's not one of these things where it's a direct line, you know, from one to the other. Mm -hmm. But but. Honestly, gay marriage, in my opinion, gay marriage was never really about gay people. It was never really about marriage. What it was really about, which you only figure out after the fact, kind of, you know, what it was really about is promoting the major tenets of the sexual revolution, one of which is that the sex of the body is irrelevant. And it's irrelevant even for things as basic as childbearing and marriage, right? That's what mm -hmm. gay marriage established that. I see. You know, that we could degender the institution of marriage. Well, once you've degendered the institution of marriage, there's not much left, really, that's got to be gendered, right? And so that um, that released the floodgates, you could say, um, and all of the um, infrastructure that the sexual revolutionaries had built up in order to defend gay marriage, in order to promote that, all of that infrastructure, all of that money, all of those relationships, all of the establishment within the media, all of that artillery just was rotated a few degrees, boom, onto the transgender question. And that's what we're dealing with now. So it sort of greased the pole, oh, as it no were. Oh, no question. And now we're just sliding into no hell. <laughs> no, yeah, no question about it, yeah. Uh, yeah. As I laugh about that, but yeah. Well, you have to laugh once in a while, Matt, or you lose it. Yeah. I mean, at the Ruth Institute on our Facebook page, we have a joke every afternoon. We, we call it laugh in the afternoon. I and like the it. reason we do that is because a lot of the things we deal with are very dark. Yeah. 
and uh, and very upsetting and you know exhausting, mm-hmm. right? And um, we recognize that we're in this for the long haul, and we don't want people you know running crying from the room. It felt like there was a time in which we thought we could win the culture. Yeah, I don't think we can. I think it's going to die, and I think another thing will be reborn in its place. Right. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I am actually quite an optimistic person, and I feel like the transgender thing may eat its own head, especially with that excellent documentary that just came out with Matt Walsh, showing the absolute insanity of it. By the way, when when we're banned from YouTube, you can go and follow us on Rumble and (laughs) and Locals. But this is the secular dogma that you may not speak against. Secular heretics will be banned. They will be banned. Sent yeah. to Siberia. And, is, yeah. <laughs> the, the virtual equivalent, <laughs> yeah, namely right, right, Rumble. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the virtual equivalent of Siberia. Um, so, w- wait a minute, wait a minute. There were, you've said like three things now, and I want to react to all of them, and I forget <clears throat> what the first one was. Oh, well. well it feels like the culture's. Oh. It felt like there was a point in which we thought yes. we can win this. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and we tried with the Proposition 8 thing, and, and then California wouldn't let us win. And we did win. Explain what happened to those okay, who are unaware yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is, that, that's, this is a very important point. Okay, so. Just to set the stage, in 2008, the voters of California voted in favor of man-woman marriage. Mm-hmm. Okay, just let that sink in. Okay, in 2008, oh, I can't do that. A little bit to your face, sir. Hello. We hear you loud and clear. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, so the if California... I start talking with my hands, I'm going to disrupt it. But but California, so the California voters. voters voted in favor of man-woman marriage, and there's some interesting sub texts to that as to how that happened. But the fact is, the ruling class would not permit us to win. And at that point, here's the thing that I've learned since 2008 that I I didn't know that I now know very clearly, and that is that there is such a thing as the global ruling class. And the global Mm -hmm. ruling class loves the sexual revolution. In fact, they're the authors of the whole thing, right? I mean, they invented it, they created it, they promoted it. That's what I talk about in the sexual state. The theme of the sexual state is it didn't just sweep in uh, you know, it's not a cultural change, like there's no human agency. See, mm-hmm. we can, we got to stop using that language. Cultural change? Like, as if it I were, see. as if it... Inevitable. As if it were inevitable. The march of history. No, no. These people promote it, they like it, they want it. And so when the voters told them, we want man-woman marriage, they said, the heck you say, you know, and they refused to defend it in court which was their legal obligation, right? Um, you know, court challenges immediately came in, financed by Hollywood guys. Okay, Rob Reiner financed the the first series of legal challenges against Proposition 8. When it was challenged, the Attorney General of the state of California refused to defend it, which is their legal responsibility to defend the laws of the state. It was a duly enacted law of the state. They should have defended it. So there it was sitting enacted by the voters. Nobody claimed there was anything wrong with the election. There was no claim of election fraud like there has been lately, right? Um, They just, you know, we don't like it. We're not going to defend it. And um, even the Supreme Court of California said that that was wrong, okay? The Supreme Court of California uh, basically sided with us. And and here was the issue. This Mm. is the legal issue. It's a little bit in the weeds, but it's it's germane, I think. Um, The... People who who were opposed to Prop 8 wanted to say that the campaign, the Prop 8 campaign, did not have standing to defend the thing in court. And if they had succeeded in that, that would mean no one could defend it in court. There was nobody else Mm -hmm. because the person whose job it was was refusing to do it, right? State of the attorney general. And so that was litigated. You know, that, that went to the California Supreme Court. Under California law, Do they have standing to be here in court and say, we want to defend the thing? Even the California Supreme Court, which was 100% all in for gay marriage, they saw that that was crazy, that that would be the end of ballot voter voter initiatives, ballot initiatives, that would be the end of it. Because if you're trying to do something that the state doesn't want you to do, and then, you know, one of their little buddies... Uh, puts up a, a phony lawsuit or something, you'll lose by default. So it would it would completely disrupt the, mm-hmm. the the whole initiative process, which was at one time the crown jewel of the progressive theory of self government and so on. You know, you look at the turn of the nineteenth century into the twentieth century. The progressives were very proud of the fact, you know, that they had put things into place so that voters could come forward and and you know fight the ruling class, you know, kind of thing. 
And, uh, and I, I was literally in the courtroom when this was, uh, uh, when the oral arguments took place. And the, the members of that, of that court, the California Supreme Court, they were, you could, you could feel it. They were disgusted. They were disgusted with the people on their own sides, you know, normally, right? Because mm-hmm. the Supreme Court of California had already said that the California Constitution required gay marriage. That's what we were trying to amend. Mm-hmm. So you knew what they wanted as an outcome. Uh, but they saw that as a procedural thing, this would be a disaster, you know. Um, so so that was part. Of, that's part of the story. And it was incidents like that that showed me that there is such a thing as a ruling class, right? And the California Supreme Court said we had standing. Um, and so therefore we continued to litigate and so on. And then we took it, it ended up at the Supreme Court. And as you know, the Supreme Court basically on a technicality uh, allowed Prop 8 to, uh, allowed Prop 8 to be overturned. So, and, and I, you know, remember seeing the arguments they were using were so vapid and so beside the point, you know, of the, mm. of the things that I thought needed to be discussed. And it just became clear to me that there is a ruling class and they want certain outcomes and they will use their power to get what they want. The California Supreme Court in this particular instance being an exception, you know, to that general rule, it was too much even for them <laughs> what was being asked of them. So, um, so that's what we didn't know. In 2008, we still thought we had a functioning representative government. You know, we still thought that it was possible for people to be involved in a way that is now, you know, we're now all kind of looking around trying to figure out, well, what are we allowed to do? You know, what what does make a difference? How can we, you know, actually push back in an effective manner? You know, that's all, you know, in the years since Prop mm-hmm. 8, you know, that's all been thrown into question on a number of levels, not just on the sexual stuff, obviously. So today, do we have a functioning representative government? I don't think so. I, I mean, minimally. Minimally, we have the, we have the forms of it. We have the appearances vestiges. of it. Mm. We have, yeah, you could, you could call it the vestiges, and but but there are so many places where that system has become corrupted um, that it's very difficult to to say there's a, a kind of a clean line between what the voters want and what the system delivers you know when you say there's a ruling class what does that mean because you'll be accused i'm sure you have been of conspiracy theories yeah, yeah. is it a group is someone leading it well, see, is it a collection know. of see, groups see this is the problem we don't really know we don't really know who's in charge of, of of all of these things i think after um after covid a lot of people are very suspicious of a lot of the people in charge of things you mm-hmm. know the world health organization and you know our, our public health establishment. Yeah, and, I am. You know what? You know people who wouldn't have been before. Yeah. You know are are concerned about that. As somebody who's been involved in pro life and pro family things for a long time, I wasn't surprised by a single thing they did because these people have been lying to us about the effects of abortion, the effects of contraception. They've been lying to us about this for a long time, right? Um, the the effects of divorce on children, ah, the ah, the health yeah, risks of, of anal stuff. sex, and yeah, s- yeah. these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they they have they have not been truthful on those issues for a long time. But you know, to kind of see it so bold in some of the ways that it's now, um, you know, coming to fru- fruition. The problem is that when things are being done in secret, you, by definition, you can't have all the facts. Mm. You know, we don't have all the facts. But we have enough circumstantial evidence to see, right, that there is a that follow the science is a joke. Follow the science is a is a tool for shutting people up. I think indeed, indeed. It, you know, um, and you know, so I don't know who they all are, but I can recognize their works when we see them, right? Um, when you see a statistic being changed, like the way it's defined. I mean, I have a couple in my book that I talk about that just drive me crazy, you know. In the late 90s, for example, they stopped. Do you, do you really want to go there? Yeah, let's go. Yeah, okay, okay. So at one time, this is a little thing, but it's indicative. At one time, um, you could get domestic violence statistics that were broken down by marital status. So uh, married couple, cohabiting couple, dating couple, you know, uh, you know, so on and so forth. You could see it all broken down. And, of course, when you looked at that, you saw that the safest place to be involved with someone was in marriage, right? N- not even close, right? Well, at some point, they stopped collecting it by marital status, lumped it all together as intimate partner violence, 
And so you're, you know, this clearly deceptive, you know, clearly deceptive. Who did that? I don't know who did that. You know, was, does some, is there some man at the top pulling the strings? I don't know. Probably not on something like that. Probably not. Um, so there's, uh, there are enough things like that where you go, you know, there's a, there are a group of people who have an agenda. We could talk about that a little bit if you want, but there are a group of people who have an agenda and, um, and they have enough power in their sphere of influence to push the system in a particular direction. And it's very hard for anybody to resist what they just did because you can't even figure out what they just did. You know? Absolutely. What's difficult when you know someone's <laughs> lying to you is that there are far more many options, you know, now, now on the table. So if you said something to me and I know it's false, then I think, well, what, what is the truth? Then right. there's a spectrum of things that might be true. Right. So the question is then, okay, well, if they're lying to us, where do I go to get what's actually happening? Right. And I think this is why there's such a vast array of conservative media with different opinions and theories, because we don't know what the truth is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, so where and do, in each yeah. and in each different little area, it requires a lot of expertise yeah. to get to the truth. And so I can answer one of your questions right there. If you want to know reliable information about sexual issues, you come to the Ruth Institute. Because if we put it out there, it's because we've studied it. You know, And so we have a, a whole variety of some studies we've conducted ourselves, because I have a house sociologist working for me now, Father Paul Sullins, mm -hmm. who's done extremely important and original work on a lot of these questions. And then we you know, compile research that other people have done, and I interview experts. I have my own little video podcast, The Dr. J Show, mm. and I'll interview people and you know, get them on record about their research and that kind of thing. Let's let's put a link to that, Neil, The Dr. J Show, and yeah. the links people can subscribe to your channel. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. but but um, it, but, it take, but the point is that to to support your original point, it takes a lot to do that well, right? You don't want to shoot from the hip. Mm -hmm. You don't want to make stuff up. You know, you want to say. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. Uh, I know enough to know that what you just said wasn't true, <laughs> mm -hmm. but but the big picture of what actually is true. But wanting to have that epistemic humility to say, I'm not necessarily sure, because we all crave certainty. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. And so we are likely, if we think you're lying, to jump on any bandwagon that accuses you of that lie, no matter what that person says. Right. The other thing I find interesting is just like the modern left mainstream media has made a meme out of racism, when you start saying mathematics is racism, success is is racism, homeschooling, I'm like, I just you've you've made a mockery of something that's legitimately evil. Right. Same thing with what you the several words you just said: research papers, experts, doctors. It's like I don't even know what that means anymore. Right. 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 That's right. So I'm not saying that we can't <laughs> arrive at certain truths based on scientific studies, be they sociological or otherwise, but it's just to say. We've we've so degraded those terms that when I come to someone who disagrees with me and say, "Look at the research," it's they a, have every it, right it's to like say multiple yeah, choice. Right. Well, maybe there's another research that de debunks your right, research. Right, right, and and when when people create, I, I just call it junk science is the mean term for it, but advocacy research, right? And they ah. put it out there, and this and this headline goes all around the world. You look at it and you go, "That can't be correct." Okay, the headlines gone all around the world. By the time you open up the paper, read the paper, figure out what was wrong with it, and then explain it, the damage is done, right? I mean, the da you know the, the the impression has been created, yeah. and that's a kind of work that I I started doing you know way long ago. Prop eight, I was doing that all the time. People would you know I I get an email first thing in the morning, Doctor Morse, did you see this study? And I'm like. No, let me look, <laughs> you know, and, you know, so debunking research has been something that we've done for a while. Mm. And, and now with Father Sullen's on the staff, he's, he's primo. It, I mean, do, he's it does really seem good. to me, I don't know what you want to call the, the, the left, the woke. I don't use the, I don't use I don't the term what, left, but, but what anyway. term would you like to use? Uh, I just call them the sexual revolutionaries. Okay. It and, is interesting that most things revolve around that, isn't it? When we refer to the left and what's so insane about them, it's not that they're against insider trading or terrorism. They seem to be against... Christianity, Christ, uh, traditional Christian sexual morality—that's what they're against. I mean, that that batch of people. But the reason I don't say left and right is because there are too many people associated with the right or hangers on with the right who are just as problematic yes, yes. in many ways, just as problematic. So I think it's very well, Trump, for example, affirming transgenderism and 
pro-life but affirming trans and right. transgenderism you know um and and if you look back historically um the the people who created um, who for, the first president to have population as a policy, to have a population policy, was Richard Nixon. Hmm. The first person to bring population issues and population control, frankly, into government, into U.S. foreign policy, was Henry Kissinger. You know, so they're not leftists. You know, you can say what you like about them, but left mm. doesn't do justice. I like that. Uh, so see, sexual revolutionaries. That's it's who really, they are. Yeah. That's who they are. And, and and they're against us. They're against all of us who hold to traditional Judeo-Christian sexual morality. And as you know, I'm sure, that includes a wide swath of, of faith traditions, yeah. you know, who who agree in whole or in part, you know, uh, with what we would say now is the traditional radical Catholic position. We're, yeah. we're now, we're kind of the last guy standing uh, holding that flag, but... It's Oof. it's correct. The flag is correct. You know the the teaching is correct, um, and so that's what we have to that's what we have to put our emphasis on is that we can know now. You, you know, a lot of this was revealed to us divinely, but also a lot of it is natural law and and easily observable. Well, now we've been doing this bodacious social experiment for like fifty years. We can see the results. Mm-hmm. Okay, the results are not pretty at all you know and so now we can go through chapter and verse and go well that didn't work that didn't work that didn't work i mean what do you what do you call work right <laughs> you know a million children per year losing access to their parents through divorce is that a success does anybody really want to own that you know um, they but, do, but they want to own it under a different guise. They want to say the freedom to be happy and yeah, to live your best life and yeah. other bullcrap slogans. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And 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 to heck with the people left behind. You know, to heck with the human wreckage behind left behind. So so now I think we can say categorically, Matt, that after all these experiments, you know, kind of one permutation after another, um, that traditional Christian sexual morality protects the interests of children better than any of the things on offer now you can yeah. i think we can see that now um, but it's hard for people to connect the dots and i would say that's what i'm in business to do that's what the ruth institute does that's what i try to i try to connect those dots every mm-hmm. chance we get and you know we put out a press release i try to always make sure that, you know we're we're objecting to something <laughs> you know, we can, usually we're saying oh that's really stupid um, <laughs> but at the same time we try to use that as an opportunity to state here's what we think you know, mm. children deserve their parents. Children need their parents. Children have a right to their parents. This thing that's just going on over here disrupts that. And you can't possibly not know that. So you got to cut yeah, that out, yeah. you know, kind of thing. So. It's unfortunate that revolutionary has a positive connotation in this society. Maybe the sexual deviance or um, something more pejorative oh, oh, might be in yes. order. I guess that's right. I guess revolution. But then what's difficult is you've got some sexual deviants like Dave Rubin, who lives in a sodomitic relationship, who I love. He's a friend of mine. Is that so? Yeah. And yeah. he's also, you know, he just did IVF. That's that's abominable. Surrogacy. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. awful. Yeah, we wrote but about I, that. But I, but I love the man. And not just do I love the man, I also think he has a lot of interesting and helpful things to say yeah. that pushes back against... The sexual degradation in our culture. So it's it's it be it would be lovely if we had the good people on one side and the bad right. people on the other. But we're right. all sort of broken. Many of us have false beliefs about sexuality. So how do we how do we navigate that? Because you want to find allies where you can oh, find no allies. Kidding. <laughs> no kidding. You know, I I I try not to irritate people gratuitously, uh, but um, but I think it's important to. Come- I love you, Dave. In case you just heard me call you a sexual deviant, I, I do love you. <laughs> But one of the things he's for, right, is free speech. He would hear something like that and say, okay, maybe maybe I'm offended, I'm not, but I, I'd fight for your right to say that. So yeah. we can get on board well, with I, that. Well, I, I, I hope he would still say that. You know, I hope we don't he get would. to the point. Yeah. He would. Um, but, but that has a way of deteriorating. You know, the, 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 abstract, the abstract defense of free speech has a way of, yes. of um, getting worn down when, when something that you really care about is at risk yeah. somehow. But um, but but anyway, what was I gonna what was I gonna say? Um, Nuance. How do we navigate? Yeah, How do we find allies yeah, well, and at the same yeah. time push back against the things they hold to be true? I, I think one thing that is important to me, at least, um, is that is that we come back to first principles wherever we can, and and I think there are some people willing to rethink their first principles. You know, yeah. um, the feminists, the people who are committed to feminists. 
feminism who are nonetheless against transgenderism, it's because they still believe that the body is relevant, right? That, mm-hmm. I mean, they haven't come unglued, you know, so much. Uh, unhinged, unmoored, I guess it would be the right word. You know, they're still, they're still tethered to the reality of the human body, and that's what allows them to, you know, to, to push back against transgenderism. But, you know, at some point you have to say that there certainly have been aspects of feminism that, are, that led us to where we are. You know, the, the kind of uh, idea that sex roles are all, uh, c- that everything's culturally constructed, you know, um, and, that, and, that, and the scapegoating of, of the male sex uh, is something I could never abide um, you know, in spite of being committed to my career and education and all that, you know, that was the part of feminism that was appealing to me. But I could never abide the scapegoating of half the human race. I, I, I don't see how anything good can come from that, you know. Um, so to, to bring things back to first principles, I think, is, is helpful. And I, th- I think now is a moment, because of all the <clears throat> degradation that you talked about earlier, where there are people who are willing to say, yep, everything's on the table. You know, we don't have free elections. We don't really have free speech. What the heck is going on here? You know, okay, everything's on the table. Let's talk. Let's talk about what you took for granted as being okay. You know, you you, you aligned yourself with certain kinds of feminism. You aligned yourself with certain forms of birth control. You thought that was going to be harmless. You thought that was going to be okay. You aligned yourself with the free speech that includes pornography. Wait a second. How's that working? You know, um, that's how I'd put it, Matt. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, of course, I I have my friends, I have my enemies. <laughs> yeah. But <clears throat> Peter Kreeft said, "When a maniac is at the door, feuding brothers reconcile." Yep. I think that's a a great line to rally <clears throat> different Christians or people of conservative faith. Say, uh, but I think it's also something to be said in political terms. You know, yeah. like if I disagree strongly with Dave, or if he disagrees strongly with me. We're brothers, and and he's a. I think he's a good person in many respects, has many virtues. I'm a deviant in many ways myself, unfortunately, and trying to repent of it and grow in it. But that we can seek common ground to fight fight off these enemies. Mm-hmm. What do you think Trump did? Uh, he seems to have because you were talking about the ruling class. Oh, Trump seemed like a gigantic wrench that was thrown into those works. No yes. matter what you think of the guy, obviously yes. there's criticisms that could be leveled at him, but it seems apparent that it took. Uh, you know, the ruling class by storm, and they were pissed for four years. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's exactly right. If you had any doubt, uh, the way they reacted to him basically proved the point. The way he, they reacted to him and the way, the way they cover for Joe's seeming senility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the things they cover for versus the things that they, the, the mm-hmm. things they attack and so on. And it's so, so insulting to our intelligence. They do something that's obvious and we say, that's... Crazy. Why would you do that? And they say, well, you're crazy for thinking that right. there's a cover-up. It's called up. gaslighting. It's called gaslighting. And it's, and it's very common. I think that is one of the things that, um, that we do well at the Ruth Institute, and one of the things I put a lot of emphasis on, is helping people to look through the, the propaganda. You know, the, the propaganda that we are subjected to is simply endless. And again, COVID made that very clear. I, I, I think, you know, I think in retrospect, at the beginning, people are like, oh, maybe this is a thing. You know, and they took it seriously, did what they were told. But as the thing unfolded, it became clear that we were being manipulated, right? Yeah. Um, and that the and the, the the shutting down of dissenting voices, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So, again, there are people willing to rethink things that weren't before. And the way that fits in with the sexual revolution is this, Matt. The sexual revolution is irrational. It can't work. It can't be made to work. Um, and yet... And yet, people are drawn to it. it. It's a fantasy. I call it a fantasy ideology. Okay, it's a fantasy ideology, meaning that people wish this is the way the world could be. We want the world to be this way. Um, it benefits us if the world is this way. And so, by golly, we're going to persevere. It's in like thing. communism. It is exactly like communism. If you look at it, communism and the sexual revolution and fascism and covidism, they all have the same structure. The intellectual structure is this. Fantasy ideology doesn't matter what the dream world is going to look like. Okay, that's a distraction. Okay, Mm -hmm. but they posit this beautiful dream. Just don't take into account human beings and their nature. Well, well, 
changing human nature is always part of a totalitarian ideology. That is always at risk. They all, all totalitarian guys and gals want to change human nature. That's what they're against, right? But anyway, so you have this huh. dream, you have this fantasy that you want to have happen. It can't happen, but in order to make it look like it's happening, you need a lot of power, you need huh. a lot of propaganda, and you need a scapegoat. Because oh in gosh. spite of the pro power and the propaganda, you won't make it work. You can't make it work. Every step you take takes you farther from reality, right? So then you got to have somebody to blame when the whole oh thing takes. Oh my gosh, you're blowing my mind. This is so obviously the case. Keep going, sorry. Okay, well, there it is. Keep going. That's it. Okay. I, I, I well, explicate it more. Dig well, in. Okay, so what's irrational about the sexual revolution is the following, okay? Sexual revolution, short version, there's a long version, but the short version is anybody can do anything they want sexually and nothing bad will happen. <laughs> Ever, to anyone. Not to you, not to anyone around you. Okay, it's all going to be great. Now, no human culture in the whole history of the, of the human race has ever done such a thing or even attempted such a thing, but there you go. It sound, Doesn't it sound great? It sounds great. Sounds great. And have my pleasure without my sacrifice. That's it. No sacrifice. And, of course, in order to make that work, you got to do something about the pesky babies, right? So the, the, so the, the sub... The subparts of that are the contraceptive ideology, which says we must separate sex from babies, okay? Then the next part of it is we must separate sex and babies from marriage because we, we, we don't want to impose on adults the, the responsibility of a lifelong commitment to your child's other parent. That's, that's too much. That's obviously, you know, off the table if we're saying that you can do anything you want and nothing bad will ever happen, right? So the kids... The, the kids are resilient. That's the way we get around that, right? If, if, assuming they ever got born right. in the first place. Right. The kids are so resilient, they don't care if you bring home a new boyfriend. They don't care. In fact, it might be good for them. Oh, oh, you know, oh, don't get me started. No, I want to get, get you get started. started. No, 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 no. Let me started. finish this thought. Let okay. me finish and this then thought, we'll and then we'll back come back to, to that one. But, but, but so you see, it's crazy it to crazy. think that you can have a whole society where sex is sterile. That's crazy. It's crazy to think you can have a whole society where kids don't need their parents. That's crazy. And then the third part of the sexual revolution is the gen what I call the gender ideology, which encompasses certain branches of feminism and, of course, transgenderism and homosexuality. And that is that the sex of the body is not really very important. And you can do whatever you want so socially, culturally, sexually. You know, it doesn't matter who your partner is. doesn't matter how you present yourself. Um, and, and if you really want to, you can change the sex of the body. None of that matters. <clears throat> so that's the gender ideology. Well, that's obviously crazy, too, because men and women are different. And, you know, if you're a normal human being, you are going to encounter evidence on this point on a daily basis. You're going to see men and women are different. Look at that. Wow. Hey, look at that. Sex actually makes babies. Huh. How about that? It, you know, I mean, you're going to get evidence on a regular basis to contradict the sexual revolution. So therefore, if you're going to keep the thing going, you got to have a lot of power and you got to have a lot of propaganda. And, and if, if you once you start looking for propaganda, you'll see it everywhere. You look at some story about um, w w happily childless people. Now, why do we need a story about why is that news? Why is that in any publication anywhere? Is it? Oh, it's all over the place. Sure, sure, sure. You know, you read story, people writing in about how, you know, there, there'll be some human interest story about, you know, uh, th th this person who really is very content without having any children and so on and so forth. That, that still gets, those things still get. I thought you meant uh, happy children without parents. Oh, you're, no, You're no. saying oh, happy no, parents your without children. No, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Happy, happy adults. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm happy. Expendable that, income, you know. All, all, all of no this burdens. type of stuff. Or, and, and periodically you'll see people talking about open marriage. You, see, you still see people talking mm -hmm. about open marriage. Will Smith and his person. He <laughs> pimps out. Or <laughs> pimps out's the wrong word. I shouldn't you know, say that. You but. know, it... it Allows to be all these things have been disproven like multiple dirt. times that they don't work, but they still keep popping them up, right? And why are they doing that to 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 keep the whole intellectual structure alive? That it's really okay, you know. And and the biggest problem, Matt, it's those dang Christians. See the taboos. That's the problem. We got to get rid of the taboos. The taboos are harmful. They're the problem. That's Reality the problem. is the problem. That's it. That's it. In the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas cites, uh, I kind of reference them. Those are his commentaries over there. But in the Summa Theologiae, he quotes St. Gregory the Great's work on morals. And he talks about different effects that result from lust. One of them is a hatred of God. Um, there's a dulling of the intellect, but there's a hatred of God. That's really Precisely for why, why the sexual deviants hate Christians. 
Because right. we don't just want our behavior tolerated. We want it celebrated. Right. It right. must be celebrated. Right. Tolerance isn't enough. Right, right. If I can get you started uh, on how it is <laughs> this propaganda <clears throat> seeks to establish in the minds of us not only uh, that what they're doing is harmless, but that it all, it's actually healthy for children right. that they have right. divorced parents or that mum right. brings a boyfriend <clears throat> home or right. 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 mum aborts their baby brother or sister, you know? So, so um, in the beginning of the sexual revolution, some of the pioneers of the sexual revolution, I would put Kinsey in that mm-hmm. category, Alfred Kinsey. Absolute disgusting and, person. And Wilhelm Reich. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with him. A little bit, but more with Kinsey. I, yes, yes. I think most Americans would be tend to be tell more us, familiar. Tell us about both. So if you get Wilhelm a Reich. Doesn't that sound delicious? Anyway, um, he was um, he was a you know a kind of a pseudo scientist in um, Germany, Austria in the 30s and 40s, and he actually wrote the book that's called The Sexual Revolution, Mm. and that went through multiple printings, and he was the guy, basically what he and Kinsey both wanted to say, building on Freud in a way, is that um, repressing your sexual urges is bad for you. I mean, this is the basic idea, Mm -hmm. and it it does kind of come from Freud, but it's kind of a, kind of a a mashup of Freud, but, but anyway, the, 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 they glommed on to that thought, right? From wherever it came, mm-hmm. from the pits of hell, maybe, but mm-hmm. from wherever that thought came, that uh, that repressing your sexual urges is a bad thing and it will harm you mentally. They built on that the idea that um, they didn't quite say it this way, but the idea that sex is an entitlement, sex is a need. Mm-hmm. And both Kinsey and Reich had the idea that children were sexual beings and that it was important that children's sexual uh, desires not be repressed. So there's children should be allowed to have sex, and their parents shouldn't interfere with this. Now, to be fair to them, neither of them, I think, was themselves a pedophile or lusted after children. But to make their system work, they had to have they had to kind of redefine what it meant to be a child, right? And so people, parents interfering with children's natural desires to be sexual with each other, uh, that this would be harmful to the child, right? And so we had to make it possible for kids to have their own apartments, for example. This is something Reich was big on. They have to have their own apartments and their own income so that they can have sex. Well, you know, when you think about our welfare state that gives people, you know, that you can qualify for uh, social support, you know, even when you're a minor, if you have a child, well, what that means is that that 16-year-old who has her first baby, she can move out of her mom's apartment and be on her own. And now whatever whatever supervision her mom and dad might have offered is now gone or, you know, very, very limited, right? So we've kind of done that in a, in a way. Um, so wait, where was I going with that? Uh, we were oh, talking about how uh, we're being demanded to celebrate oh, the, the deviancy, not yes, just tolerate it. Yes, yes. Oh, so here's what I want to say about that, Matt. There are two competing systems there's the the sexual revolutionary sexual system, and then there's the traditional Christian Judeo Christian sexual system. Yeah. Sex and reproduction are absolutely central to a society's life. They, it colors everything. It affects everything. Okay. So one system will drive out the other. They cannot coexist. I think this is now becoming obvious to people, right? That y- you really can't coexist with one systemic something that's driving the whole system you can't do it piecemeal you know you're going to end up one way or the other you're going to end up driving out one will drive out the other um and so from a structural perspective you know if you're the ruling class and you're thinking this all through you'll think to yourself well we got to get rid of this we got to get rid of that we got to celebrate this we got to celebrate that so that's one way to look at it the other way to look at it is that the, the person who is behaving in a deviant manner, which is a very broad set of people mm-hmm. at this point, right? Um, a lot of times they're going to have a guilty conscience about it. If there really is a natural law embedded in the heart, somewhere you know that it's not right. Even while you're doing it, you know it's not right. And, and I, can, I can tell you from, from experience of um, being involved in the sexual revolution, full participant in my 20s, you know, um, I, even while I was doing it, I knew it wasn't really right, right? And it has to be the case that a lot of people also know that, but they don't have a, a clear picture 
of what the alternative looks like, right? So um, you what what we end up doing, and what you know, I I try to pay attention to and try not to provoke unnecessarily. We're provoking the guilty conscience, mm-hmm. which is extremely um, powerful reaction. I think you know, protective, right? The person um, becomes very protective of their psyche, which kind of proves that moral relativism can't be true. Right. Well, that's a great point. If you and we might have some beautiful women out there who have had abortions yep. and have <clears throat> repented of it. Bless you. We love you. This isn't you know this isn't meant to be condemning of you. Um, the act was horrific and repenting is necessary. We may have dads that encouraged, yeah. you know, there was a time in my teenage years where I said to my girlfriend who I was fornicating with, if you got pregnant, you'd have an abortion, I hope. Mm-hmm. God have mercy on me, a sinner, right? right so um, right, right. why do I say that? I say it for this reason. If you have had an abortion and then you realize or someone's telling you that what you just did was pay somebody to kill your innocent unborn child, it seems to me you've got like two main options, right? One, accept it accept that you just killed your child or go along with the sexual deviant uh, propaganda, which is you just did something beautiful Mm -hmm. and it ought to be celebrated. Bloody hell, if those are your two choices, which one's more easy to go with? Right, right. For a while, for a while. But after a while, it, it, it builds up and you can't, you can't deal with it anymore. And and then when you can't deal with it anymore, the sexual deviant propagandists say that this is just an illusion. This this right. this regret you have is something brought on by a Christian society. That's right. That's right. That's right. And if you're if you happen to be gay, if your issue is that you are um, same sex attracted, mm-hmm. and you get fed up with it and you don't like it anymore, you can't change. Right. Science you have, you says have you Stockholm can't change. Syndrome yes. As well, yeah. yeah. Science says you can't change. Mm-hmm. Right. And so and the and the therapists that may want to help you change, since you're the one asking for it, will be criminalized or, or, or lose their licenses yeah 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 so it's very interesting isn't it how the revolutionaries block the exits i mean i i view that as a way of blocking the exit yes. the, the prohibition what on a great therapy way to put it. right and then and and likewise what um what goes on with the crisis pregnancy centers the whole pregnancy care uh movement i'm, I'm sure you're aware there are more pregnancy care centers than, are, than there are abortion clinics in the united states okay that's yes. a fact yes and what do the pro-choice people say about those clinics oh they're lying to women they should be shut down they should be prosecuted for consumer fraud they should be forced to uh, um, to refer to for abortions you know all of this kind of, they they block that exit that alternative that the woman has they don't want her to have the alternative they're trying to keep her trapped in the system so um, those things I think are are very telling right I mean if, if you I think once you see it, you can't unsee it. You know, once you start to realize that this is the mechanism and that this is what people are trying to accomplish, well, then you start to see it all over the place. Yeah, 100%. You said earlier, you know, I think your words were to his credit, Kinsey may not have been a pedophile, but I think what he did was even more vicious if that weren't the case, since he conducted experiments on babies that were yeah. sexual in yeah. nature. Yeah, I don't think he did those experiments. I, sure, I think but he, if, he had whatever. some creep. He had some yeah. creep who who, right. co- who collected data for him. Yeah, he deserved to be executed. He was that wicked. Yeah. And yet we have got Liam Bloody Neeson starring in a movie that celebrates him. There you go about the ruling class. Kinsey said of, and you know this, I'm sure, of Hefner, if Hugh Hefner, no, what did he say? If Hugh Hefner is the prophet I am his pamphleteer. No, no, no. Other way around. Hefner said that of Kinsey. That's right. If Kinsey's the prophet, I'm his pamphleteer. Right, right. And so now that, we know that. Kin- oh. And now we know that Hefner was abusing people left, right, and center. You know, now some of the former bunnies have come mm-hmm. forward and said, you know, he was a rapist and he was this and he was that. What? What exactly did you think was going on in the Playboy Mansion? You know, come on, people. You, idiot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what did you think was going on? I mean, fantasy. Yeah, That's what it, you thought. It That's is. what you bought into. That's what I bought into. It is. It's a fantasy. It is. A, and I think. Um, I think at this point in history, most people are both victims and perpetrators of the sexual revolution. You know, a, an awful lot of people have some past um, with this, with mm-hmm. these issues. And so I think to see that we've all been flooded with propaganda, I think it's helpful to see that because it helps you realize it wasn't all your fault. I mean, I, I just want to say that even if some of it was your fault, it wasn't all your fault, you know. Um, because 
you know, you were going with the flow. You were going with what you were surrounded with. And you figure out for yourself that, you know, that something's wrong. And, um, you know, and now you got a choice about what you're going to do with that information mm, that wasn't right, right? You know, Therese, this sounds like a, a tangent, but it's not. Therese of Lisieux said that she takes tremendous comfort in the fact that God is just. She says, this attribute of his that causes many fear causes me great comfort because it's precisely because he's just that he takes my weakness into account. And, uh, you know, I, I stumbled across porn when I was eight. You wow. know, I, I was told by my father, who is in many respects a good person, um, nice collection of playboys you got there, don't let your mother find out, you know, wink, wow. nod. I had a best friend's mum who bought us pornographic videos at the age of 13. She bought us liquor. I'm 13. I'm getting hammered drunk watching porn. That wow. was my childhood. Right, right. It's so important that we not justify or rationalize our sin, and yet have an appropriate compassion on ourself, right, given right. the things that were imposed upon us. That's right. That's right. I, I, I totally agree with that. And that, that that kind of pattern that you're describing, it goes across the board of all the different aspects of the sexual revolution. You know, um, teenage girls or mom putting them on birth control, yeah. uh, right, or or divorced parents and the the chaos that that introduces into into the, the life of the family. And then the next generation not seeing an alternative to divorce, you know, and or the alternative to divorce is just don't get married in the first place, which doesn't really solve the problem, <laughs> right? Um, and so we're now in multi-generations of people being misled, doing things that didn't really work, being frightened and ill-informed about what might work, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you see this very commonly with children of divorce. This is one of the most, the easiest to see, I think, because... Anyone would have, any honest person would have to say that the child of divorce is innocent. It's not their fault that their parents got divorced. Although sometimes kids will take that on themselves mm -hmm. and imagine it's a way of them, of them empowering themselves or of, um, um, of coping, you know, uh, with it, you know, to say, well, if I had been a good boy, this wouldn't have happened, you know. Um, it, it, it makes them feel a little more powerful than they how, really are. How does that make the children is, feel more powerful? Isn't that powerful? crazy? I don't is, understand it. I would that think crazy? that that would take your power if you thought you were the cause of your parents' divorce. What you does know, that mean? It, 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 we're talking six-year-olds, right? I mean, it doesn't have to make sense. I see. Uh, right? You know, but but somewhere in their in their little minds, you know, a lot of times... I'm the cause. Yeah, you know, must... Because kids are intrinsically self-centered. You know, that's kind of oh, who they I are. That, that's who they are in the first place. You know, I mean, I had a foster child say that to me one time. We used to do foster care. Did you know that? I didn't. Yeah, we did foster care for three years in San Bless Diego. You. Um, yeah, I, one time we had a little boy, and I asked him this question. Now, whose fault is it that you're in foster care? I asked him that. He said mine, and I knew he was going to say that. That's why I asked him because I wanted to get it on the table. You know, and I said, you know. Well, well, wait a minute. What exactly did you do that has, well, blah, 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 blah. Well, no, it's your mom and dad have problems, you know, and that was their problems and not your problem, you know, and it's not your fault that you're in foster care. I wanted to be able to say those words to him. It's not your fault that this happened to you. But anyway, apart from that, I think most people would agree that the children of divorce are innocent parties. It's not their fault. Mm -hmm. that, you know, whatever went on between their parents, it's not the child's fault. But the child... Uh, is their their little life is disrupted by it? Um, if there are subsequent remarriages or repartnerings, their their life is even more disrupted by that. And so then they go, grow into adulthood. They want to get married and stay married, but they don't really know how, and they're afraid, and their fears interfere with them. You know, their fears make it harder. Uh, you know, I, I think anybody can relate mm -hmm. to that. You know, mm -hmm. that you're so. You, your first argument, and you think, well, you, you're not the right person for me. We must separate. Mm -hmm. You know that kind of that kind of thing, and that's been doc documented for a long time, Matt. That's not a secret. You know that anybody who studies that question knows that children of divorce have greater challenges sustaining marital relations and, and long term committed relations. That's just. Mm -hmm. And everybody who studies this knows that that's true. So now you're cascading the problem, right, of mm -hmm. from one generation to the next. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get better. You know, it's not, this is not progress. This is not progressives. Mm -hmm. Give me a break. This is not progress. This is dissent. Regress. This mm -hmm. is, re, you know, this is a dissent, right? 
So we should call the progressives the regressives? Regressives, right. I never call them progressives without air quotes or something, yeah. you know, because the self-proclaimed progressives, I might call them that. <laughs> but, but this is their conceit about themselves. How, how important is it that we not go along with their terminology? Oh, very important. Black Lives Matter would be an example. Oh. It seems to me that both racism and the philosophy that undergoes Black Lives Matter are evil. <clears throat> All right. I think saying things like biological male is conceding yeah. linguistically. Yeah. You're a man or a woman. Right. Saying right. gay marriage concedes linguistically. There is no such thing. Right. Right. Um, of course, sometimes when you're talking freely, you can't help but slip into these things. But what do you think it's important that we say, for example, pro death instead of pro choice? Yes, I think the proper use of language is extremely important because the person who controls the language controls your thought. Right. And so. And one. <clears throat> Pieper talks about this in his essay on the abuse of power. Either I'm saying something true to you or I'm lying to you. Mm -hmm. And if I'm lying to you, he says, I've ceased communicating because I'm not allowing you to be a sharer of the reality, which is yours by right. I'm actually I'm withholding something from you. So, yes, the proper bloody use of language mm -hmm. and not in order to manipulate you. That's what liars do. That's exactly. what flattery is. That's what propaganda and sophistry That's is. That's right. That's right. But we say pro death or the pro abort not to gain control of the argument, but to say what's true. To say what's really there. Right. It's obvious they're not pro choice. It's never been about choice. You know, it's never really been about choice. Um, but but. This principle that you're articulating cuts across a lot of different issues, you know. So the trans issues, it's very important that you not go in with their with their language. So I my preferred term is a man who says he's a woman. Yeah. You know. And another way you can see this, um, last year we, we we did our summit for survivors of the sexual revolution. Um, one of the speakers, this woman named Erin Brewer, I asked her to give a talk. Well, let me get, just back up a little bit. Summit for Survivors of the Sexual Revolution is what it sounds like. You know, we're trying to deal with the fact that everybody's survived, you know, and that you've um, and that you're trying to move forward. You know, you're not a victim. You're trying to move forward with it. Um, last year, we introduced a pamphlet for sidewalk counselors outside Planned Parenthoods who encounter a trans minded client. OK, so. People going into Planned Parenthood, they're not all going in for abortions. Some of them are going in for cross-sex hormones or puberty blockers. Okay, that's part of Planned Parenthood's business plan now. So we had heard about that, and and our pro-life, you know, counselor, sidewalk counselor friends were telling us, we don't know what to say to these people. You know, we don't know what to do. So we came up with a pamphlet. We worked with our friends at the uh, American College of Pediatricians. We came up with a pamphlet that the counselors could use. You know, just, would you like to talk about alternatives to whatever? You know, I'm not even sure how they're going to use it. But anyway, we were trying to come up with something, you know, that would be helpful. And so last year at our summit, I asked um, one, of our, one of our experts to give a talk on the psychology of the trans-minded client. Who is this person? So the sidewalk counselor has some idea. Who's this person? Well, what she came up with when she started talking about this, 15-minute talk, she came up with the fact that the word trans can be used in at least six different ways. Okay? So somebody could say, so, so this teenager walking into the Planned Parenthood, that's a person who's you might say, is confused about their identity and they want they want these treatments. That's one kind of person. But then there are also these grown men who have never done any kind of medical treatment particularly, who after they were grown men decided that they wanted to present their, themselves as women. Um, and they basically are what is called autogynophils. That is, they are sexually aroused by seeing themselves dressed as a woman. Okay. That is a very different person mm -hmm. from that teenage kid. Mm -hmm. Very different person. And you use the same word. And she had a whole bunch of other. <laughs> and then there's the pretender, like this guy, uh, Will, Will, Leah, what's the guy's last name? Leah Thomas? The, sw the swimmer. Mm -hmm. Leah Thomas? The, Will, William Thomas. William yes, Thomas. but that's the guy. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the swimmer who's pretending to be a woman mm -hmm. so he can win because mm -hmm. he was a mediocre male swimmer. Okay. He's a pretender. Then you have your predator. People who are pretending to be women so they can ha have access to women's spaces. And we're 
we're told that we're only allowed to believe that there's one thing here, which is that poor teenage child that we're all supposed to be sympathetic with. But in point of fact, the term covers at least a half, do- a half dozen different things. When somebody's doing that to you, you know that it's deliberate. You know, that, that, that's not an accident when you use one word to mean six different things. You know, they, they're trying to confuse you. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, isn't... Indeed. Yeah, right, right. No, so I'm, you, you, you don't want to take... You gotta, you gotta, um, I don't know, it's like a full-time job keeping track of this crazy, uh, the, the crazy, crazy lingu- linguistics. Mm. There does seem to be a significant counter push against the insanity. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem like we all agree um, on the specifics, but the recognition that the woke, sexual, deviant, whatever you want to call it, agenda is insane. And it seems like we only woke up when we started telling our children or we saw that our teachers were indoctrinating our children in these false things. Right. Maybe over COVID, parents right. became more aware of what was being... Speak to that. Yes, I think that's right. I, th- I think the COVID thing and the, and the kids doing remote learning, more parents became more aware of what was going on. Um, but the fact is, sexual education has been in the schools and has been crazy for a long time. You know, I mean, when you really think about it, the idea that a teacher should be teaching children about contraception. That is not an idea that comes readily to your mind. We're just so used to it. You know, we've become, um, what's the word? Mm-hmm. Frog Desensi- in the pot sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Desensitized to it, you yeah. know? And so, um, honestly, um, transgenderism didn't just pop up out of nowhere. It, it's been building on things that have been in place for a long time. And so it's my hope that people will look at this and say, you know, we need to get the sex out of, sex out of schools. Completely. And, and our kids out of schools. Completely. Yeah, completely. Completely. Until you guys shape up, we're not sending our kids to these schools, you know. Talk, talk to that more, because I, I, I think that public schools are garbage. I think they're death camps for souls. Yeah. And I yeah. think the majority of Catholic schools are too. Yeah. And I think your child would fare far better if you took him out of school and actually just homeschooled him. Yeah. And if you did nothing but read The Lord of the Rings occasionally on the couch, <laughs> they would end up far more well-rounded. But yeah. you, so you say this, though, yeah. and then the response is, how dare you? Like, don't you understand that this is my only option? And fair enough. I can right. see where people are coming from. Right, right, right. But how important is it, do you think, at this day and age that we, of course, not send our children to public school? Well, I, I, think I mean, it's... what bloody hell, what the bloody hell else needs to occur right. for parents to wake up and say, oh, maybe that's too far? Like, do they need to be actually molesting your children yeah. for you to take a stand? Yeah, 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 yeah. Am, yeah. I, am I overstating No, it? no, not one bit, not one bit. I mean, what, how, why, ba- why aren't how I? bad does it have to get before you get off the couch and do something about it, you know? And so I, I, I celebrate the fact that parents are getting activated and those are the those are the very kind of people that we want to see at our events right because i'm i'm not interested in talking to people who just sit around to complain right but if you want more facts and figures and strategies and allies for you to go into whatever your field of battle might be you know and this is certainly one legitimate one um you know we'll help you we'll help you with that that's what we're about but i think i think for parents of young children it's important that you do everything you can to protect them, which means, which may mean taking them home. Mm-hmm. Okay, but I, we cannot simply abandon all of those institutions because when the the most involved and engaged people all retreat, what's left? What's left? But the the unengaged, uninvolved, and the machine You're just rolling. I, I agree that perhaps there's work to be done in reforming these institutions, but I don't think that means our children have to remain in them. My Total, primary totally responsibility is my kids, not Absolutely. your kids. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I totally agree with that. But that, but this is a role for others in the family to play. Okay, so the mother and father are educating their children right now. You're in the throes of that. Of, that, of course, that has to be your primary responsibility. No question about mm-hmm. that. But maybe grandma and grandpa need to be down at the school board. You know, maybe yeah. mom's at home with the kids and dad's in there fighting. You know, um, but we cannot simply abandon all the institutions. And and maybe, you know, maybe the, the correct answer is we we dismantle certain things, you know, that we get rid of them completely. Mm-hmm. But if you do nothing, right, if there's no, you know, withdrawal is only part of a strategy, right? That can't be the whole picture. You got to do something to reform or resist or, or, or contain uh, the madness of what these other institutions are doing, you know. Um, and it's not just the schools. Uh, I, I mean, I see this with the oh my golly, the doctors, the doctors and the and the uh, and the lawyers. You know, the, they're under enormous pressure to conform 
to the sexual revolution in, in a whole variety of ways, you know. Um, and so I think each person, whatever their, whatever your gifts and talents and skills are, you know, you need to plot out a course for yourself to figure out what you can do with what you know and where you are to somehow resist, push back, reform, you know, what, whatever. Well, you've been in the Ruth Institute. You founded it, I presume? Yes. How long has it been exi in existence? 2008. What have you done that's actually helped? I don't just mean individuals, but institutionally. Is it even possible at this point? Oh, I, I don't know. I don't so know. Have you done anything that you can go, well, this was a huge victory that we had? No, really can't. Well, so I mean, how do you keep going? Yeah, you know, we won. We won. We won Prop Eight, um, <laughs> but then it was taken away from us. Yeah. Um, um, While you think about that, let me mention Nicosi yeah. because this is the National Center on Sexual Exploitation in DC. A few things that they've been able to achieve. I don't yeah, they're know. great people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they they were instrumental in getting Google to ban apps that were pornographic. They were instrumental in helping. Those in Utah and other states declare pornography a public health crisis. They were instrumental in getting Hilton and other hotels to remove pornography from their chains. Uh, McDonald's and Starbucks started filtering their Wi-Fi because of their work. But it just feels like one step forward, 8,000 steps I back. I know, I know. Yeah. Well, you know, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> no, not really. Um but, but, well, the question was, have you done anything that's helped institutionally? It either has or it hasn't. Well, I, I, I can't point to anything. Honestly, I can't point to anything. What I can say, though, is that I think that what I do and what the Ruth Institute does is to help people be more aware of what we're dealing with mm -hmm. so that other people can deal with whatever is their yeah. their niche, you know. And what's interesting is you're probably unaware of the cascading effects that your work and my work and the work of Nikosi has done. I mean, the reason... Groups like uh, Daily Wire are so huge right now are probably because people like yourself and others helped educate these, like, say, Matt Walsh's when they were younger about the <laughs> insanity of transgenderism yeah. that then led them to have this platform where they could actually make yes. a, a cultural impact. I, I hope so. I hope that's the case. But but because of where I'm situated in that in that chain of public opinion, right, that I'm 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 doing a little bit more abstract work, yeah. you could say. Um, it's harder to see when you're not the activist. You're not the for activist, for example. Yeah, but 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 I love the activists, and we always give an award to activists. We give an act, award to the activist of the year, you know, kind of thing, um, every year. Um, and that's but, very... and the, the activist is on your shoulders. Like when I wrote yes. my book, The Porn Myth. Yes, that has about forty pages of bibliography in the back. So whatever good that book may have done, it was precisely because of the people who were far more intelligent than I was, and who were able to put far more time into researching these things than right, I, I right, could have right, done. Right, right, right. And, and you know what? what so part, trying I mean, to unhurt your feelings as well. No, 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 no. I, I, I was joking. But, but part of the question is how do you sustain yourself when you're in this kind of yeah. uh, endeavor where you're looking down, where you, where you can't see immediate results, you know? So I take comfort from the people who reach out to me and tell me that, that, uh, that I did them some good in some mm -hmm, way, you know, mm -hmm. and that happens, you know, and I appreciate it when it happens. Mm -hmm. um, we were at Cleveland Right to Life, uh, you know, earlier this spring, and um, <clears throat> I didn't go. Some of my staff went and people came up, Ruth Institute, oh, is Dr. Morse here? Is Dr. Mm -hmm. Morse here? I'm a Catholic because of her. Mm. You know, okay, all right, so I'll take that, you know, um, but... Uh, this is going to sound like it's weird. I mean, like it's way off, but bear with me. My husband's a big Second Amendment guy, mm -hmm. big citizen self-defense guy. When you and the movement for citizen self-defense is is deep, it's broad, it's much. They're much bigger than we are. You know, any pro-family thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and the pro-life movement is much bigger than we are. But when you think about the Second Amendment and the right to self-defense. The arguments for that have been understood since the Magna Carta. You don't have to, they don't have to invent the arguments. They don't have to start mm. from ground zero. I feel like I'm inventing the arguments. I feel like I'm explaining why we need <laughs> marriage. You know, why you shouldn't allow your daughter to cut her breasts off or to yeah. have her breasts cut off. No one was talking about Nobody that. Was, no one's ten ever minutes talked, ago. No one's ever ne needed to talk about that, you know. But even in even in Prop 8, when it wasn't so radical as it is now, you know, we needed a defense of marriage as an institution. Why do we have marriage in the first place? Nobody has ever really been called upon to answer that question. I look at my free market friends, okay? 
because I, I, my doctorate's in economics, mm-hmm. and that's where I got my start in free market economics. It's great stuff. Well, the arguments in favor of a free market go back to Adam Smith and back before that to the Salamanca School in, um, in, in Spain and in medieval Spain and so on. Okay, so those arguments have been around for a long time, but nobody has ever been asked to explain why do we need marriage? What does it do, you know? And so we're starting... You know, we're, we're you know we're just a few centuries behind Matt, so I accept that. Yeah. You know, um, and I, I I hope I'm doing some good. In fact, I'm going to take that back. I'm going to say I know I'm sure. right. I know I'm right, Matt. Yeah. And that's what keeps me going, even if nobody pats me on the head or I can't point to a specific victory or something. I was listening to a video by Peter Hitchens yesterday, the like uh, Christopher Hitchens brother, who's uh-huh. a conservative commentator in England, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and his yeah. point to a somewhat antagonistic interviewer was to tell the truth is worth doing, whether or not anything is affected by it. Just right. saying what's true right, right. in a day and age where we're all telling lies is a right. powerful thing. Right. I agree with that. I agree with that. And that keeps me going. And my husband keeps me going, you know, to know that I have him behind me, you know, that he has my back, mm-hmm. you know, kind of thing. You've talked about the evils of contraception. Yes. And I know that you work for, what are you called? Is it a nonprofit? Is it a, the Ruth Institute? What is it called? Uh, well, it, what kind of it, We're a nonprofit company? organization. Okay. We're a nonprofit organization. I, I can say we're Think tanky. Okay. So you, well, let's say that you work <laughs> yeah. for a think tanky nonprofit organization that yeah. includes many beautiful Mormons and Protestants. Yes. How do you, how do they accept what you have to say on contraception given that they're open to those things? Well, um, has that it, been a point of contention? As not particularly. No? Um, and, and the reason it's not particularly is because, um, I don't insist that everybody agree with me on every point just to work for me. You know, if they they know what I stand for, if they if they're on, if they're on board with enough of it, then I'm okay with that. You know, I don't I'm not. Now, th- and th- but they know what our message is. They know what our, you know, messaging needs to be. But I think some of them I've brought around, you know. I mean, yeah. I've had numerous occasions over the years, you know, where I have been in front of either a mixed group or an evangelical group. And they have said, Dr. Morse, tell us more about contraception. We want to hear more about Mm -hmm. this, you know. And so I've tried to um, present it in a way that they can receive it. You know, I try to remind them what is a historical fact, which is this this is the common heritage of Mm -hmm. the whole Christian tradition, right? Um, Because when you deny the teleological aspect of the sexual act, it gets difficult trying to explain why sodomitic acts are wrong. Right. And this is why when you actually often look up Protestant arguments against it, they re- they rely solely on scriptural verses instead of sort of that and right. the, the, the natural both, law. The both and stuff that Catholics like to do yeah, so much, you yeah. know, the, the tradition plus scripture, tradition, yeah. natural law plus divine law and you know, so, on, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so that's the way I handle that particular issue. And, I, and you know... I, I don't encounter a huge amount of resistance, um, but it's it's because I'm, it's a select group, right? And, you know, the people who work for me, who work immediately for me, with me, the people who invite me, they invite me because they want to hear it, you know? So I can testify that there are non-Catholics who are ready to listen, at least, about it. Mm-hmm. So so that's where your point comes in, that um, if, you, if you tell the truth, you just leave it out there— it, yeah. That that's worth doing. That's yeah. worth doing all by itself, you know, because they know I'm not going to I'm not going to soft pedal it um, or what. And, and they also know I'm not going to blame them, you know. And sometimes I'll say, listen, guys, I'm not going to make a theological argument here. I'm just going to ask you to consider the following question. What has contraception done to society? Let's just look at that. See, this is a good point, right? Because you're, in this hypothetical example, asking somebody who's not on board with you yet, who may feel that to attack contraception is insane, out of date, wrong, okay? But you're calling them to to ask the question, to be open to where you're going. So let me ask you something um, that maybe you are opposed to. Uh, Were we wrong to ever encourage women to go into the workforce, oh, mothers to go oh, into the workforce. Oh. What has that done? What oh, has the results of that been? Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. I'm willing to talk about that. Because yeah. I'm asking somebody who has a PhD and obviously yeah, works yeah. institution, oh, yeah. and I'm not saying that you shouldn't, by the way. That's not my position, no, but no. I want to ask the question. I think, I, I think um, in this book I talk a little bit about feminism um, 
because it's it's a I avoid the word feminism, so mm-hmm. let's let's continue to avoid the word feminism sure. and go right back to the t- to the question: Were we wrong to encourage women to go into the workforce to encourage mothers, mothers in particular to, to work encourage? And and I think I'm going to say yes, we were wrong. That is wrong to encourage mothers to go into the workplace as if that is normal, as if that is to be desired, as if that is superior to the raising of children. I think that was a wrong turn. I definitely think that was a wrong turn. And it's a wrong turn that many women have suffered greatly from. Greatly. Okay, Matt? Um, how, how so? What's your oh, experience been in talking oh, to these women? Oh, honey. Oh. <laughs> well, okay, so I was born in 1953. So that means I came of age when all of this stuff was coming of, it, coming of age, right? And... I was very drawn to the idea that I should get a job, that I should have an education. I was good in school, you know, and I had intellectually a lot of intellectual interests, and you know, so I was very drawn to careerism, what I would call careerism. Um, but you don't see the downside of it until it's too late to do anything about it. And so, in my case, the particular downside of it was I postponed childbearing for so long that we ended up with a long period of infertility. Okay. And that, for me, that was the crisis. That's when I came back to the faith. Wow. See, I had been, I, I was a cradle Catholic, mm-hmm. memorized the Baltimore Catechism in fourth grade, um, Thomism for children, as I'm sure you know. <laughs> sure, that, yeah. That's what that is. Essentially. Um, so uh, I abandoned the faith, mm-hmm. and but it was infertility that brought me back to the faith because this is where I could see that I'm not in control of everything. I can't control the outcome, get everything I want by working harder, being smart, so on and so forth. But by the time you are in your mid-30s and can't fix this problem, I can't go back to my 20s. I can't go back and undo the, um, the, the sexual misadventures that I had that led me here, that led me to postpone marriage you know, and and all of those things, the priority that I put on my education, the priority that I put on my career, the way I treated my husband because of that, you know. Um, all how of how those, did you treat your husband? Uh, um, let, let me finish this one thought. And I'll go back to it. All of that, I couldn't go back and get that lost, that lost time. And whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, there is a ticking uh, fertility clock, you know. I mean, it, that's a reality. And so... Um, millions of women, millions of women have had the exact same experience, and every last one of them thinks they're the only one. I mean, it's it's, it's horrible. When you really think about that, it's horrible. In the meantime, Phyllis Schlafly was trying to tell us... Who's this? Phyllis Schlafly... Oh, okay. Um, she's not important in a way. Okay, uh, the, that's all right. The, the previous generation was trying to, to tell us that it's possible to raise your children and then go to college, and then go to law school. That's possible. That option has been there for a long time, but nobody ever talked about that as a correct path for women, which tells you that there was something corrupting about that form of feminism and that messaging and all that. That that was about something else other than women's choice and empowerment. See, that's, Mm. the you know, you then take the next step to think, hmm, I was sold a bill of goods there. But, But anyway, the point is that... Once you figure out that it was that that priority that you placed was incorrect, it's too late to do anything about it. And the other thing that it, that has happened as a result of that whole let's push women into the labor force is that they don't look for spouses at a time when they should be looking for spouses. Um, it affects how we interact, male and female. You know the expectations we have of each other. And now I'll answer your question. What about my husband? How was I treating my husband? Okay, so I had it in mind, as the feminists have told us, that we must have equality in in the home, in the work in the home, because that's what's really holding women back. What's holding women back is their husbands aren't doing enough of the chores. Okay, so you fool around with that for very long. You're mm-hmm. going to create a lot of dissension and mm-hmm. you know um, Ill, Ill at ease inside inside the home right and you know and I was you doing begin that. to look at your husband like the enemy who refuses to play his part in the exactly. household duties exactly exactly you're competing with your husband instead of loving your husband instead of cooperating instead of collaborating you're competing with each other and and I can honestly say to you Matt 
that infertility was the first time in our marriage where it was really, really obvious that men and women are different. And it's like, that is really stinking weird. It took that <laughs> long to figure that, that out. But, <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the truth is, this cu- being un- wanting to conceive and being unable to conceive cuts to the heart of your maleness and your femaleness, and we each re- reacted to it in different ways. It meant something different to him than it meant to me. And in order for us to, to live together, in order for us to, to, to pass through that experience together, I had to be willing to accept that this was not um, parallel, perfect reciprocity going on here. You know, that he had his own path, yeah. that he had his own needs. And and same with me. I expected him to understand me perfectly. Well, maybe I should give him a break and try to understand him, you know, mm. uh, on his terms instead of on my terms all the time, you know. So, so you know, to, I didn't expect this, Matt, but to... In my spirit of being forthright, I think the question you asked was a good question because it was focused on one thing. Mm. And I, I have to say, I think it was a mistake. I think it's still a mistake to tell women that their highest priority is to go to work. And Maybe not even just their highest priority. Maybe that's not strong enough. But maybe it's just to tell them to go to work. Like yeah. <laughs> my wife, you'd love her. She's powerful. She's <laughs> choleric she takes command of a room if no one's going to do it she's she's beautiful <laughs> she's sassy she's hilarious um she's never led me astray I, try, love I, I love her yeah oh i'd never say that to her face but between i'm just joking oh, shut uh up. i love her I, I not only do i love her but she's my favorite person like i like her yeah. i find her delightful yeah. okay I have no doubt that if she was working, we'd be making way more money, you know, because she's just better at me and this stuff. But if she said to me, honey, what do you think? Should I take a job? I'd tell her, no, Mm -hmm. I don't want you doing that. Mm -hmm. And she would listen to that because she knows I love her. And and I'm so glad she's at home. Um, And you have children? Four. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're still at home? They Well, I mean, the eldest is... 14 they they're homeschooled they are at home but they're not definitely always at home. <laughs> not always you know we did we did try out different things along the path but this yeah. is what works best for us yeah i guess my question for you then is what is your advice we have many young men and women watch this show yeah. right yeah they're, they're looking to date they want to get married yeah. they're thinking about you know what do i do once i get married you know my, my children now will say things like when i go to university and i say why why would you why would you go to university like i'm open to it but why, why, why is that? And I think maybe something similar should be said to, to mothers. I mean, no doubt the feminine genius pervades the workspace. Mm-hmm. I'm so grateful for your work mm-hmm. and I'm glad for the work that you do. And so certainly I believe women can be called to these certain professions. Right. But right. on the whole, why not say, why would you think about working? Right. Why not move to a rust belt, dingy town like Steubenville <laughs> where you don't actually have to be making $200,000 a year to live yeah, and just yeah. let your husband work. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to put words into your mouth and I'm happy for you to disagree with me on this, but what would your advice be to young men and women well, who are maybe engaged see, right now? The, yeah, see, here's the problem, Matt. Mm-hmm. This is where the sexual revolution has several interlocking parts and this is where the divorce ideology comes in and rears its ugly head and plays a very important part in people's decision making. And that is that you cannot be sure that your spouse will stay with you for a lifetime. And so there are a lot of women, I know this for a fact, who uh, get more education than maybe they really want and certainly who stay at work longer than they really want after their kids come because they don't really trust their husbands to be there for them. And so that's another thing where you change an incentive over here, the incentive to stay married, right? You can change that. And it has all Mm. these ripple effects all over the place, right? See, it used to be when I was growing up, I knew people uh, who, who, you know, the couple would get married and um, the wife would work for a while while hubby was going through medical school, putting hubby through. She got her PhD, putting hubby through. And then he would get, you know, he and maybe they'd have a child or two, but she'd be working. And then when he was a doctor and established and so on, she'd stay home with the kids and everything. Well, you can't do that anymore. You can't trust that he will not run off the secretary, uh, you know, when we, after you've made the investment um, and then he ditches you. You can't do that anymore. And, and this is how people are thinking. And they're not wrong to be thinking like that. And the more, um, the more secular they are, the greater the burden that is. I mean, my, my daughter is... Sounds like your wife. My daughter is a, you know, is a, is a ball of fire and she mm-hmm. has her doctorate. And, you know, so she encounters a lot of people 
and she listens to her friends and she listens to them talk and she hears their fears, you know, about, you know, I want to get married, but we're going to, yeah, we're going to get married, but we're going to keep separate bank accounts, you know, all this type of stuff. And and I did that and I thought like that. So, mm-hmm. so these, these moving parts are, are all you connected, mean. you know? So what I would say to young people, I, I, first of all, I want to say to young people, I'm aware that it is really difficult to find a suitable spouse. I mm-hmm. hear this from men and women alike. Where are all the good people, you know? So that's mm-hmm. discouraging, um, you know, and I, I recognize that that's discouraging for people. But um, but um, so you got to solve that problem, <laughs> first of all. Um, but, but then once you do get married, the, I think the key thing is do not rack up too much student debt, number one, and do not take too big of a mortgage. Right, because as soon as you do that, you have limited your options. Mm. Right, so those are the most practical things. Yeah, you know that that I could say. Yeah, that's really helpful. What's difficult is I understand what you said there. People think this way, and they're not wrong to think it, since right. we don't live in Christian utopia. So mm-hmm. we we have to deal with the the real world effects, and yet to get married and to not trust your husband or to not fully yes. trust your wife, even though they can hurt you because yes. they're fallible and sinful and wretched human beings like you are. Yes. Uh, is a recipe for disaster. Yes. I mean, um, my wife and I have hurt each other deeply over the years. Um, divorce was never a word that could be uttered. One of the nice things about being a Christian is I know that if I abandon my wife and children and chase after something else, then I'll, I get to go to hell. Right. And that's a long time. Right. So yeah, even, you're going to be dead a long time. Yeah, it turns out. That's what I heard. Yeah. <laughs> Self-interested <laughs> reasons in the Christian sense are helpful too. Right, you know? right. Because marriage is bloody hard. You put two wretched human beings together and see how that works out. It's tough. It's bloody hard. Right. I remember the first time my wife and I had an argument. This was about 10 years into our marriage. And at that moment, it was so heated, I realized to my great terror that this isn't unbreakable. Does that make sense? No. My so marriage can... isn't unbreakable. It could be broken. It could be broken. Right. I didn't realize that until then, until we just... Both just got really angry over this one thing, and we began to like just resist and to to hide. It scared the shit out of me when mm-hmm. I realized that, mm-hmm. you know. But but well, you but you but you repent and you pursue your wife, and you know, like, yeah. I mean, if you have the idea that if we get into any arguments, then maybe we're not compatible. I mean, what a insane idea that is. That's right. If that's you're right. a man and she's a woman you're not compatible, you're not compatible. yeah let's, let's just go with that yeah, yeah. <laughs> right compatibility is not really a choice uh, but 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 love is a choice you know Indeed, and love yeah. is always a choice and this is a, this is where your friend thomas is so helpful <laughs> right our yeah. mutual friend thomas you know where he's so helpful is that that love is a decision love is always a decision and all these other th- things that we call love mm. you know are about emotions or is i I like the way you make me feel, so therefore that's love, you know. Well, no, not really. To love is to will the good of the other, to will and to do the good of the other. That's what love is. And so there's Mm. an element of self-sacrifice. There's an element of looking outside the self. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing that authentic love does is it it calls you to look outside yourself, you know, to to the good of the other person. So right there, teleology pops up again, right, because you... Go well. What is the authentic good of this person? Um, you know, they they want something. They say they want something, and it's not good for them. Okay, as a parent, you deal with that all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, but that might be a factor in your married life. It might be a factor in your dealings with all kinds of people. You know, that they want something, and you're not going to give it to them because you don't think it's good for them, and they're going to be unhappy with you. And so there's going to be tension. There's going to be unpleasantness. But it's love that sees you through that. You know, that helps you to mm-hmm. know. You know that it's uh, okay. This is not the best right now. This is not this is not the part we like. But mm-hmm. we need to pass through it in some way. Tell us about this summit you have coming up. Oh, if you don't mind. No, I, I don't mind. What, yeah. What is it and where is it? And... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, the summit for survivors of the sexual revolution is wow. something we cooked it. up. We cooked up this idea a I few love years it. ago. Um, to to be, we, we hope that it will be a an annual regional conference, you know, where Cleveland Right to Life are the people who inspired me. Yeah, you know, that's terrific. Yeah, they're ter- they're amazing. Um, but anyway, the the idea is, you know, two days of of conferencing, 
um, punctuated with an awards dinner Friday night. Mm-hmm. Um, at the awards dinner, I always pick out people that I think uh, deserve attention. Sometimes they're already well known. Sometimes they're not. Um, so this year, our keynote speaker will be Kristen Hawkins, who's president of Students for Life of America. We're going to give her a Pro-Life Leadership Award, and she'll give the address that night. Um, and then we'll give an award to Mr. Walt Heyer. Yeah, tell us about this fellow. Yeah, Walt Heyer. I'm going to give him an award for what we call the Public Witness of the Year. I always uh, 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 celebrate somebody whose testimony has been important. Okay. Walt Heyer lived as a woman for eight years. And he figured out that living as a woman was not solving any of his problems. Did he have mutilation surgery? He did a number of things to himself. I don't know all the details, sure. Bless but him. he did Bless a number him. of things to himself. Um, and, and he was an adult when he made the decision to change, so it was a little different from a lot of what goes on. But anyway, um, he walked it back, had a conversion experience, um, and now spends his life giving <laughs> his testimony and trying to help people who have who are either have been through it or are considering it or what a hero. parents. Oh, oh, you know, you should come to the summit just to shake his hand. He's 80 years old. Okay. So he's in good health, but he's 80. So if you want to <laughs> shake his hand, you should really now, come. Now's the time. <laughs> now's the time. So, um, so he's going to talk about how change is really possible and we'll give him that award. And then we're, we're giving awards to the scholar of the year right. is a guy called Scott Yenner. I don't know if you know Yenner. He's a great no. guy. He's, he's a Missouri Synod Lutheran, it turns out. Um, he's written several important books of political philosophy, and he and he attacks feminism um, among his other virtues. But mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in fact, they tried to cancel him at his university not too long ago over mm. this very thing. So, um, so we give him an award for Scholar of the Year, and then um, Activists of the Year. Like I mentioned, I always have. I've got these two ladies Fantastic. who are on fire. I can't even keep up with them. So um, I want people to check this out, summitforsurvivors.org. Neil, can you put that in the description? Mm-hmm. Check that out. It's going to be in Louisiana on June 24th through 25th. That's right. If you live anywhere near it. You should come. Come. You should totally come. And it's the best food in America. What? Louisiana has great food. Okay, I'm just <laughs> it saying. Does, it does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I'm Man, just saying. I'm just saying. Um, but so, so that's the kind of thing that's going to be going on at the summit. But one thing that I'm doing, especially this year... I'm going to give a 15-minute talk, defend defend traditional Christian sexual ethics without fear or apology, just straight up defend it. And at the end of the summit, you're going to get, everybody who's there is going to get a flash drive that will have the slides to that talk and the script for that talk so you can give that talk. So it won't be anything so super special that only I could do. I mean, I got it there. I put it all together mm-hmm. so you have it so that you can defend yourself. You can defend your own that. values. Yes, yes, yes. That's so, when I tell people to get my book, The Porn Myth. I tell them that you know, there's like 40 pages of bibliography, you know, so you can just cite it. You can, right, right. It's, it's, the footnoting has been done for your convenience. Plagiarize it. Take it. Quote exactly. It, and you've done the hard work of exactly. the intellectual study, exactly. which you put into this talk that people can then, right. I love it. Right, right. And, and I'll tell you what inspired me about that. Um, every once in a while, I get annoyed. <laughs> Imagine that <laughs> every in this Monday. line of work, in this line yeah, of work, yeah. that I should get annoyed. Um, but when gay marriage, when when the Supreme Court redefined marriage in 2015, the marriage movement pretty much threw up his hand, its hands, and said, "Oh well, mm-hmm. we tried." Yeah. Okay. What if the pro-life movement had done that in 1973? Great point. You know, come on. Jack Wilkie, and so there was this doctor in Cincinnati named Dr. Jack Wilkie, and he made a slideshow. He had these slides of fetal development, and lots of people used Dr. Wilkie's slides to go around explaining to people the key issue here is yes. life in the womb. What is it that's in the womb? It's a human being in the womb. And the pro-life movement never let go of that, never let go of that. Wow. And so my intention is to never let go of the question, what is marriage all about? Anyway, why do we need marriage? What is owed to children? That's what this talk is going to be about. What do we owe to children that marriage gives them that nothing else gives them? And Mm. I'm going to give you the ability to make that talk because, come on, how much worse does this have to get? 
We wouldn't be looking at the Dobbs case if Jack Wilkie had thrown up his hands or, if, you know, if Nellie Gray, who founded the March for Life, if she had thrown up her hands. You know what I mean? I mean, absolutely. You know? For those who are watching from Europe or Australia or yeah, wherever, right. <laughs> is this going to be on your podcast? Will you post the talk there or where well, will you put it well, online? Well, ultimately, we will. Good. Ultimately, we will. Uh, and, and you can buy a virtual pass to this thing. Good. So good. Even I didn't if you know we should say even that. If you can't come, now we can't send you the bread pudding and the jambalaya. <laughs> you have to get that yourself. But, <laughs> but go to Summit for Survivors, and if you can't make it to Louisiana, you can watch this online. Wow, wonderful. Yes, yes, yes. The whole thing will be online. And then and then if you've bought the virtual pass, um, you'll be given links to the to the raw video before it's all processed and produced oh and put out. Because that takes Thank about six months. This. I mean, think about it. You know, you know. I know. Right, Neil? I mean, it takes a yeah. while to put them out. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, mm. so yeah, that, so that's what we're doing. And I'm excited about it. And we always have cool people come. This is the thing. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not just me and my cool speakers. I mean, you go to this uh, website on this little goober here. There's a little QR code. Yeah. You know, um, if you go to the website, you'll see the whole list of the okay. speakers and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it's not just that batch of cool people, but the attendees who come are very cool people. Always. I had a thought while you were speaking about Roe versus Wade. Yeah. And uh, when this gets overturned. Yeah. I'm just going to throw it out here. Yeah. I, I would like to help build a $20 million church to our blessed mother in Thanksgiving. Oh, where? Let's do it. Where would you put it? Who cares? Let's do it. Let's do oh. it. Pennsylvania, <laughs> here, Ohio. Think of how many rosaries have been prayed for oh. the overturning of this evil thing. It's true. And now it's going to be overturned. What are we going to do to thank our blessed mother? Yeah, yeah, Let's do yeah. it. $20 million. Yeah. You got $20 million? I don't, but I'm going to get it. <laughs> I bet, man, I believe you could. I believe you <laughs> I'll get could get my wife it. on the case. I might have to give her a job after all. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Well, do you know what? The whole pro-life movement is glued together with women like your wife who are doing it from their kitchen table and raising the next generation of pro-life a warriors. bloody men. No right kidding. There. Every yeah. old woman I see pray, because it usually tends to be these armies of old women praying their rosaries outside of abortion clinics. Man, Satan sees them and he soils him. Self. Good. Good. See, but this this is the real women's movement. This is what I keep saying yes. to people. You know, the pro life movement is the women's movement. It's the alternative the crisis pregnancy centers. You go to a meeting of those people, it's ninety percent women. A few guys show up, their husbands, mm -hmm. you know. I mean it's it's Mm. How come? How come we don't count as the women's movement? You do. You I are don't... as you say, you are it. The rest is a lie. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's right. Where does this go? I mean, we've talked about the breakdown of marriage. Well, first, maybe you've got like contraception, breakdown of marriage, abortion, gay, transgender. What's next? <laughs> oh, mercy. Well, I thought we were going to leave on a high note. Do oh, you we really want... Oh, do you want to leave? We can keep talking. Oh, okay. I got hours. All right. Very, very cool. <laughs> hey, wait, when's my plane leave? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good point. Um, so each of the three ideologies that I mentioned, they each have their own end game. And uh, which, you know, sadly, you can see from watching what they say, think and do, you know. Mm -hmm. OK, so the contraceptive ideology, the end game of the contraceptive ideology is population control. No question about that. <clears throat> OK, they think there are too many people in the world. What they mean is there are too many people for their needs. OK, so population control is the bottom is the end game of that. That's where they're headed. The divorce ideology the end game of the divorce ideology is contract parenting, the complete severing of biology from the legal definition of parenthood. So this was very clear to me when I was talking about Prop 8 and, you know, trying to explain why you shouldn't be redefining marriage. Because mm -hmm. if you're redefining marriage, you end up redefining parenthood. Where these people want to go is collections of adults making contracts amongst themselves um, to decide who gets legal parental rights. And so those contracts can include the purchase of gametes, sperm and eggs, mm -hmm. can include the purchase of surrogacy services, uh, and can divide up the care of the children once they're born amongst any combination of people. That's where these people want to go. Um, very dark, in my opinion, very dark. And then um, where the gender ideology wants to go, I think people now can see where the gender ideology went. Where they want to go is the complete removal of male and female from society. Male and female as concepts. Everybody is asexual. Everybody is gender neutral. That's where they want to go. And I think even beyond that is transhumanism. I, 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 
I think that's true. How could it not be? Yeah, yeah. In, in other words, to recreate the body uh, yeah. to your own specifications, you know. Um, there are some very creepy guys um, who have a lot of money, you know, who have fantasies of uploading their brain into some new thing that's part technology, part mm -hmm. human. And yeah, that's where that's where they want to go. So we're not to the bottom of this. This elevator hasn't hit the bottom floor yet, people. Mm -hmm. You know, just if you're if you're wondering whether now would be a good time to get involved. Now would be a good time. Now, to now be would involved. be a good time to get involved. <laughs> well, let's take a quick break and then come back and oh. talk about. Is that right? Yeah, it's all right with me. I yeah. don't know what time is it. When's my plane leave? <laughs> when is your plane leaves at five thirty? Yeah, it's eleven thirty right now. Oh, come on, eleven thirty. Yeah. Oh wow. Plenty of time. Yeah, we got plenty right, of time. All right, we'll okay. take a quick break. All right, Thanks, very Neil. good.
Right, go. <clears throat> Great, we're back. <laughs> All right, we're back. Are we? Did Accidentally you... did it on my camera, but oh. now, now it's looking to you guys. <laughs> There's Hello, a everyone. quick sneak peek of Neil's <laughs> face. My shirt um, for the day. I just, just so everybody knows who's watching, I just called my wife and I went, get down here now. Uh, not like that. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, she said, he did, he's really a male chauvinist. I really totally. am. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I was shocked. She said, I don't want to. And I said, submit woman. Anyway, <laughs> she, she said, uh, she said, well, should I get out of my pajamas? I'm like, yes. Another, another advantage of homeschooling. Anyway, so she'll be here soon. And I want to have her sit in this chair and talk with you because I think you two will get along like a house on fire. And we'll, okay. there'll, be some great, there'll be some great conversation there. All but, right. Well, that sounds good to me. But, but before we do, I want to tell people. People, two things. Please subscribe to this channel and click that bell button. That way, YouTube will be forced to pump out this Christian propaganda <laughs> whenever we record it. That would mean a lot to me. The next thing you can do is when YouTube bans me for being some sort of phobe, I'll be over on Locals. Locals is a free speech community. I put daily podcasts out there every day. Go to mattfrad.locals.com, click the link below, and please join our growing community. We've got like 10,000 people over there right now. You can even support us over there, and when you do, you get bonus stuff in return. mattfrad.locals.com. Matt and you Fred. don't have to support to be on Locals. That's right. You don't have to support. You can come and watch our daily morning podcast called Morning Coffee. We talked about Thomas Aquinas today, and we read through one of his articles. We're doing a book study right now. Dr. Ed Fazer. I just paid him enough money, uh, and he's agreed to. Was that passive aggressive? Uh, he's putting together a course on Thomas Aquinas's five ways. He's the premier uh, expert in Aquinas's. I would say Aquinas's he's a brilliant argument. Guy. I love it. And those that course will only be available over there. So go to mattfrad.locals.com. Mattfrad.locals.com. You said a great word before. I did. The camera went live. So wait a minute. Wait, 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 yeah. wait a minute. You promoted you your channel. Can I promote? Mine? I would love you to. Okay, so Ruth Institute has a YouTube channel too. Go on mm -hmm. over there. We don't have as many people as he does. So, so hurry come up. on over. Fill them, <laughs> fill them up. And we have a link in the description. So everybody who's Beautiful. watching, please go follow, subscribe. It's, it's important Beautiful. that we support truth. Okay, Gnostic death cult is yes. what you just said. Yes. What is... What what do you mean? What is who is what is? <clears throat> okay, so we were we were chatting back and forth. <laughs> now all of you have come back into the middle of a conversation between <laughs> me and Matt. Um, <clears throat> I was just making the point that that like all totalitarian movements, they hate the world as it actually is, and they want to remake the world in their own image and likeness. Okay, and so this is where the the fantasy ideology comes into play because this is their. You know, they're the dreamscape that they have in their minds, you know, of how great it's all going to be. Um, but one thing that's and, and you were commenting that you thought it was very interesting, the power of the propaganda and the scapegoat and how all that. I never is, thought of it that clearly yeah. before. Um, but the, the other point, as I was reading more and more about these, you know, kind of following different rabbit trails, you know, to 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 make sure that I was on the right track. Um Students of totalitarian movements will tell you that they all want to change human nature. So whether it's communism or fascism or, you know, now the sexual revolution, there's mm -hmm. always some aspect of human nature that they need to change in order to do the dream. OK, and that uh, the attempt to change human nature, of course, always fails. But that's the pretext for needing all this power. Right. Um so when you see that, that they hate the world as it actually is, that puts into your mind Gnosticism, because Gnosticism is in some way a revolt mm -hmm. against creation, and generally our physicality is part of it. <clears throat> and so um, the sexual revolutionaries, they do, they're at war with the human body. You know, they hate the human body. They hate, the, in, in spite of their um, desire to indulge it all the time, you know, and your their encouragement to indulge it all the time, they resent the limitations of the human body, right? That if you have sex, you don't just get to have pleasure. You may also end up with this lifelong responsibility as a result. They don't like that part, right? So always, and, and the male and female thing, you can totally see there that it's a Gnostic cult, right? Um, that they they hate male and female. It upsets them. You know, whatever, where, whatever else is going on in their ideology, they hate male and female. <clears throat> and so... Um, so it has these aspects of Gnosticism of being in revolt against our physicality, our physical existence. And then that turns them into a death cult. I mean, you know, if you're at war with the human body, where's that going to end? You know, it's, 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 
people die. People get mutilated. You know, people's people's bodies are harmed. So that's what I mean when I say that. Yeah, I'm a little flippant when I say it, but I, I, but I don't think so. I mean, I think it's pointing to something that's really real. I love it. And I think it's accurate. Again, not wanting to be hyperbolic, <clears throat> wanting to use language appropriately. It would seem that the woke left that's pushing these sexual ideologies is a Gnostic death cult. Right. At war with the human body, resenting of the human body. Right. This is why I actually am like, would never let my daughters dye their hair blue or pink. This sounds like a tangent. And it do, I don't yeah, think it is. It because does, but tell because me about I, it. I think there's a war with reality. <laughs> And I think if you want to make your hair look like a cartoon character, you are in a very small way at war with reality. If mm. you you see people who've dyed their hair blue or pink and uh, are obsessed with anime, like I'm not crapping on anime, I'm not, not totally discounting cartoons, but there does seem to be something in that. Mm. If, I, if I know somebody who's like really into weed, they're also really into like anime and mm. unnatural ways of looking. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's one thing to dye your hair a different color that's, that's a natural, natural color. Absolutely. Right, to change your appearance yes. for fun or, or for whatever reason. But when you want to start dyeing your Bright hair green. to look like a cartoon character, you're, you're, you're venturing into the unreal. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's very interesting. What do you think? I never thought. I have all sorts of reactions. They may not be true. Like, I also have a thing against ripped jeans. Women with their friggin' ripped jeans looks like their legs are bursting out of them. Could we stop <laughs> this, please? You will look so That's bad in taste. two minutes That's from now. That's just a matter of taste, though. And modesty, I think. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, but then I the know women jeans. who I deeply respect who do have ripped jeans. So I, I, But the ripped jeans are not generally provocative. It right? depends how rip we're talking. Yeah, you know, and where like, we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> where the rip is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, All right, no, we've I... We've ventured far afield, I suppose. That was my fault. <laughs> oh. Yeah, Gnostic get death cult. All right, so we've talked about where this may end up, and we've talked about transhumanism. We've talked about even people identifying as animals. And this is what happens, right? It's like gay marriage happens, right? And, they, and we say, okay, well, how does that not lead to... Um, Poly... Polyamory. Polyamory. Is what you're looking for. And they say that's just the slippery slope argument. You know, this is ridiculous. This mm -hmm. is this is not <clears throat> going to happen. And the same thing will be said to those of us who say, okay, well, what's to stop someone from identifying as a beaver or a, you know, rat or a dog? And they'll say, that's that's insulting. Mm -hmm. I promise you. Give it 50 seconds mm -hmm. and we'll start seeing well, that Well, there already everywhere. are people who, who have animal fetishes, you know, who... Um, mm -hmm do doggy play you know mm -hmm. it's a it's a do domination submission thing between the dog owner and the doggy that's that that's already out there man mm -hmm. i mean it, i i think it would be good to say something about the slippery slope argument in yeah. general because when when you make that argument when we make that argument what we're saying is here is the principle that you are putting into place and if we if we apply that principle where will that principle lead if you think that is ridiculous, you need to explain to me what is the argument, what principled argument do you have for a stopping point mm -hmm. for this principle being applied, right? Wonderful, wonderful and so point. Yeah. And, and the fact is, they never give you a stopping point. They never have a principled argument for a stopping point. And when people were talking about abortion, you know, it's like, uh, oh, it's only going to be... Uh, uh, a handful of people are going to want abortions. It's not going to be that big of a deal. And pro-life people said, well, wait a second. If you can take that innocent life, won't this lead to euthanasia? Oh, no, 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 no. That'll never happen. You know, won't it lead to pe people being uh, aborted after birth? Oh, no, no, no. That will never happen. Well, and we see the arguments for these things and to some extent their implementation. That is happening, you know. Um, so to to announce a principle and be unwilling to name the stopping point of that principle. I think we have every right to ask, explain to me why not. Explain to me why not group marriage. Yeah, so when somebody identifies as a different race, as we've seen. Right, right. right. Why Ex can't I decide that I'm a black man? That's right. Exactly. That, 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 yeah, mm. I, I, so I, I think that's a, a, a important, we need to give ourselves permission to make that counter argument because what you just did in, in, in um, mirroring their argument, right, mm -hmm. I, is, I think, accurate. That is how they behave, you know. Oh, that's ridiculous. They poo-poo it. And that, you know, a um, that kind of retort is not really an argument. Yes. Right? It's dismissive, right? And I think the perfect response to someone who snorts <clears throat> at or dismisses the question is, I agree it's ridiculous. Tell me why. Right, right. What What, what is your principled stopping point? 
mm. for, for that. Yeah. You know, my friend Scott Yenner, whom I mentioned to you before the break, yeah. uh, that we're giving the um, the Scholar of the Year Award to, in in his most recent book, he talks about um, the, the rolling revolution, right? And how they'll say, this is how far they're going for now. Right, but if you keep but if you keep looking at the principle that's been announced, it's never going to just stay there for now. It's that that's not that's mm-hmm. not realistic at all. It's pretty interesting, and you know, um, one of the things I do in the in the sexual state in this book, we have a link to that below. Yeah, tell us about this yeah, book. Yeah, okay. hold it up. And... Well, yeah. So the thing I wanted to say about it first, I'll tell you about the the, the book in general. Okay, the, the, it's called the sexual state. I love this the subtext. What's the how elite ideologies are destroying lives and why the church was right all along. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I that I do in this book is to unpack the contraceptive ideology and the propaganda for it. And that means looking at the history of it. So I, I suppose a lot of your viewers are aware that in 1965, the U.S. Supreme Court enacted Griswold versus Connecticut, which made it, uh, which removed the ability of states to regulate contraception in any way, basically. Mm-hmm. Um what you might not know is that that there was 30 years of le- of attempts in the Connecticut state legislature to uh, to legislate that. Okay, so starting in 1935, the forerunner of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, and all those people went into this um, the legislature of Connecticut and said, "We want to remove restrictions on contraception for married women with serious health problems. That's all we want to do." And year after year. The little people who were at that point, it was mostly Catholic immigrants writing into their state legislators because the Catholic Church told them to do that and they did it. And they would write in and say, you know, that doesn't sound right that all you're going to do is just ban it. It's just make it there for married women with serious health problems. I mean, this is going to lead to all sorts of problems. I mean, what if unmarried people do it? What if high school girls start doing it? No, this will this will lead to a deterioration of public morality. And, you know, it's these little people saying this again and again. This went on for 30 years, you know, and, and then the court decision. So you tell me who was right in that mm-hmm. in that whole dispute, you know? Church. The church was right. What right. is the church doing today to combat the Gnostic death cult? What are the, oh, what are they doing? What aren't they oh, doing? Oh, oh, Matt. <laughs> Oh, well, the church has done pretty good with the pro-life issue. And I think that uh, I think that has largely been driven by the laity, but there are plenty of uh, clergy, priests and bishops and even Pope Francis who are uh, solid on the life questions. There are plenty of them who are. On divorce, the church has done essentially nothing. Hmm. Essentially nothing, and that's very uh, disheartening. On paper, we still hold to the indissolubility of marriage. But in fact, with the annulments being given out as frequently as they are and on the grounds on which they are, um, that the Catholic Church is, um, is not the witness that it should be. Let's put it that way. That's a serious counter witness, right, when Ted Kennedy can get divorced is it Ted Kennedy? I think it was Ted Kennedy. Sure. Anyway, you know, when people can get divorced and remarried through the annulment process as readily as they do, it's been it is it has harmed the church's witness. And I and I can also tell you that when no fault divorce came down, there was virtually no resistance by any religious body anywhere. I mean, it just it just kind of snuck through, um, which is weird when you think about it. Um, but that's pretty much. What's happened? So well, what is your opinion then on? Because it seems to me that we talked earlier about people are both victims and perpetrators of the sexual revolution. So in one sense, it seems to me t- to make sense why we're seeing more um, annulments yeah. being handed out because people may not be in a place to confect the sacrament. Right. But you think it's being abused? Well, that that that's true now. That wasn't true in 1973 or 1975 or 1980 or, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. the cumulative impact of that. And I'm not sure, I don't know enough about canon law and I don't know enough about the history of that to, to really say when did, the, when did the slippage really start. Mm. Um, so I can't answer that question. But I just can't believe this is the best we can do. 
you know, and I know some dioceses are making very serious efforts to improve their marriage preparation process because that's obviously a key element. You know, I know the Diocese of Phoenix went through a very long uh, study period and then implementation period. And, you know, I, I think there will be a lot fewer annulments handed out in Phoenix, you know, mm. um, because there'll be fewer people who, um, who who need it, you know, who think that they need it. But but still, it's scandalous that um, that it happens so often in the way that it seems to happen. But I can't believe this is the best we can do. I don't have a solution. Yeah, yet. no, that, that's interesting because yeah. I wasn't here when no-fault divorce was handed down. What's difficult is the Gnostic death cult uh, – chooses their slogans very well yes and would say what you want someone to be an abusive marriage oh yeah so and yes, so of course well, that's exactly to do what, that and of so course that's exactly what we want of course of course of yeah. course you know i mean uh, interestingly enough um the, it, it, of course not of course we don't want people to be in abusive marriages but the church doesn't require that or ask that of anybody you can get a legal separation mm -hmm. um that is that is protective Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a situation of that kind, first of all, and but the real issue is getting married again. That's the real. That's the real issue is um, do we allow people to attempt a second marriage? Now, in in Catholic theology, there is no second marriage, right? There's one marriage. Mm -hmm. If it's not valid, it's not a marriage, and therefore you're free to marry again. So that's the way a proper Catholic theological understanding would work, um, and. It has come to my attention, I can tell you how in a minute if you want, but uh, it's come to my attention in the Philippines, they have essentially Catholic marriage law, which is you can get a separation, um, and w which would have a lot of the properties of a civil divorce, but you do not get the permission to marry again. Hmm. Okay, so, okay, well, let's think that through. Let's think that through. Uh, you've got a guy who's really abusive <clears throat> or a woman who's really immature, and you're going to annul their marriage, uh, and now, or, or you're going to allow them to separate on what, whatever you want to call that separation. Now, if we let them remarry, it's not simply the innocent spouse who gets to remarry and, and now have a happy life, but the abusive spouse, the immature spouse, the crazy spouse, they get to remarry too. They get to go inflict themselves on some other unsuspecting family. How does this add up? You know, I mean, if there really is a problem mm -hmm. there that makes that, you know, that make the, either it's abusive or the marriage isn't valid or whatever, if you're, you're so immature you can't contract another marriage, why would you be mature enough now to contract, mm -hmm. to, to, to try this again? Wait a second. Mm -hmm. And I've actually heard of a case where a tribunal uh, said that to somebody. Hey, you convinced us that you were immature and, um, and uh, unstable, mentally unstable and couldn't contract marriage. So... Before you think about getting married again, you got to prove to us that you are now mature and stable. Mm. And that they, I think it's called, there's a, there's a Latin term for it. Um, Interesting. You're saying this was a church that said yeah, this? Yeah, this is the tribunal. The yeah, tribunal. this is the, the person received an annulment, but ah. with this, this proviso, you know, the one party is free to marry again because the, the marriage is, there's no marriage. They're pr yes, free to marry. They're yes. free to marry. But the person who convinced us that she was crazy, you're not free to marry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, until yeah. you do X, Y, or Z, you know? Yeah. So, well, that's kind of an interesting, um, I had not heard of that before, but it, but it made sense to me. My point in bringing up the, <clears throat> well, you just want people in an abusive marriage point was just to say that I think this is why we see so many bishops not fulfilling their role to to, to proclaim the truth is because they're afraid, like maybe many of us are afraid, that they're going to be called yeah. all sorts of names. Right, right. And a uh, gay marriage thing. I mean, where are yeah. the bishops on this thing? Oh. Where are they on sodomy? Where are they on transgenderism? Oh, I think we know, both know the answer yeah, know to that question. That, Do you want me to say it? I want you to elucidate it. <laughs> there are too many queers in the clergy, man. Make that a short. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm sorry. There, there just are. Uh, um, you know, they're not going to uh, speak out against it. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're morally compromised. Let's put it that way. So mm -hmm. whether you yourself are engaged in sodomy, if you're involved, if if you are, if you have somebody superior to you who is, you know, there's so many networks and complications. There are just a lot of people who are compromised and they're afraid to speak out. That's a, yeah. I mean, when we worked on Prop Eight. Uh, I did not realize everything that was going on behind the scenes because we had Bishop Corleone helping us um, 
Prop 8 originated in San Diego, and he was auxiliary bishop of San Diego at that time. And he was a guy who, you know, really spearheaded a lot of the things and put together the, raised the money to get it on the ballot and put together the coalition, the interfaith coalition, so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, I thought, we thought, you know, the Catholic Church is on board. This is great. You know, Bishop Corleone is our, he's our guy. But it became clear that there were a lot of clergy who wouldn't even let you collect signatures for the petition at their churches, you know. And so over time, you know, I just got, we had a, we had a little thing we were trying to market to people. You know, we had a little you know, DVD series, you know, same-sex marriage affects everyone, you know, can you tell people about it, so on and so forth. We found we had better luck with the deacons at the parish than with the than with the priests. Well, after a while, you figure out you've just got too many gay men in those um, in those offices, and they're not gonna they're not gonna open their mouths about it, no matter what they might think. Um, you know, and and there can be a variety of motives, but that that's I, I think that's the reality of what we're dealing with here. Now, how that translates into silence on transgenderism, I I I, I it shouldn't follow, but maybe it does. I don't know. And and then you add to that the fear of being called names and things like that. Mm-hmm. It's just it's too big of a step for them. How do don't you, you think? Don't I, you think? I mean, I mean, well, I shouldn't. Put yes, you on I the think spot. so. No, you can press me. I think that <clears throat> I, I take it as gospel that we're all cowards, unless proven otherwise. I tend to be. Yeah. I don't <clears throat> like pain. I don't like being called names. It makes me feel bad. Yeah. I like to be liked. I right. like people to celebrate me. Right. I want them to say lots of nice things in the YouTube comment section, which they don't, the bastards. <laughs> um, but I would like to think that by God's grace, I will act in a way that's right, yeah. despite not feeling liked. Right. I do think this is one of the things I keep telling folks, and I wonder if you agree, and I don't know how you could disagree. We ought to praise those bishops that make heroic decisions. No kidding. And maybe they're not heroic. Like totally maybe agree. it's not a heroic decision that Cordelioni banned Pelosi from communion. Maybe it's like, duh. But you got to think the amount of of hate and ridicule that's going to come his way. Okay, whatever problem you have with Cordelioni, put that to one side for now. Yeah, right. Let exactly. your praise be louder than the Gnostic death cults shouts and that's screams right. and incoherent slogans right now because if we take for granted that humans are usually cowardly or that it's least it's at least easier to be cowardly than not then let every bishop on twitter like see your praise for these men so that they will take heart and begin to say true things publicly like why why isn't every bishop making a statement about this so-called gay month yeah Yeah. i mean it's i understand the the objection we shouldn't give it more uh, airtime than it already has, but for goodness sake, we're all being, it's all being force fed down our right. throats. Right. I'm not sure why every bishop isn't making a public stance against this. Their right. silence is... Right, right. Is scandalous. Yeah. The silence is scandalous. And and I agree with you. This is a principle that we learned from parenting disturbed children. Mm-hmm. One of the things, not that the bishops are disturbed children. Edit that. Don't make a short out of that, okay? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but it's a principle of human relations. You got to catch them doing something right. Yeah. You know, you're going to get more of what you put attention on, you know. So if you jump up and down and praise something that you want to see, that's, that's exactly right. extremely important that you do that, you know. And and when you and we were always told when we had bad kids, you know, or problem kids, you know, correct them in the in the lowest key manner possible. Do not scream, do not get all upset because they like that. They like seeing you. I mean, this is a uh, it's a little bit off the beaten track. No, it's a but, great point. It's a great analogy. Point. But yes. you get the point. You get the point. You know, yeah. if you're, oh, you did what? And if you got a bad kid, they're like, hey, that was kind of fun. Look, look at, at the look, power. Look, look at the power I, I have, have over this. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to do that again, you know. But in the meantime, you know, <laughs> it, 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 so, so the alternative is, wow, you folded that laundry perfectly. That is an A plus job of folding the laundry. Yeah. You know, whatever it is, you know. So we actually, um, some years ago, uh, uh, you know, dealing with uh, dealing with all these questions and issues, we started something that we call Roses from Ruth. Um, we actually, from time to time, send a dozen white roses to a bishop to thank him for doing something. 
Okay. That is terrific. It is terrific. It's a lot of fun. It took us a while to kind of figure out how to do it, you know, and <laughs> to get the bugs out of it and whatnot. It mm. started really with a Morris Leticia because um, you remember what a mm-hmm. what a hot mess that was and still is, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. A Morris Leticia makes me very angry. I will say for, for the record, the confusion that that document has created is not helpful at all to anyone, okay, I, in my opinion. Um, and it's a it's a slap in the face to I the agree. abandoned spouse. It's a slap in the face to the to the children of divorce. It's and it's not consistent with the church's teaching. It is not. So, but people were trying to say there were some bishops who were saying we can interpret this document in keeping with the mm-hmm. tradition. And in our diocese, we're going to interpret this document in keeping with the tradition. And so what we did was, oh. We're going to congratulate that guy. You know, we're going to say something positive about that guy for saying that, um, and that's what started it. And then, since then, we uh, recently, for instance, the Bishop of Arlington made a very good teaching document on transgenderism. We sent him roses, and Father Sullins and I happened to be in town, and so we went and met with him in his office, and you know, all of that kind of Such stuff. Such a good idea. Pat him on the back. Yeah. Exactly. How do you know where to send the roses to? You just send them to the. Uh, oh, you schmooze. You got to schmooze with the church secretary. You guys say, hey, I'd love to send. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You we should do that at quarterly only. Imagine how many people watching right now. We could get. We could come up with a campaign. Well, mm-hmm. do you know when we he, could send him so many roses that he becomes sick of them? Do you know mm-hmm. what? When he came out with that document, see, I think that what quarterly did. What I think he has had this very carefully planned, because literally a year ago to the day, just or close to it. He issued a teaching document on the Eucharist. <clears throat> I forget now what it was called. Um, but we sent him flowers for that, for that document. Oh, this is a great document. Thumbs up. You know, good You know, good going. And then he had that campaign of people praying for Nancy Pelosi, and, and he sent her flowers for praying for roses for Nancy or prayers for Nancy or something like that. Um, so he had this all very um, carefully laid out, in a sense, to, to make sure that he had done everything he could do. Out of love for her. Yeah, to 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 love her and to give her every chance, to give her every possibility of of reform and repentance, and you know, and so he he went into that. He went into a major confrontation with a plan. He didn't shoot from the hip. See, and I think a lot of your armchair quarterbacks do not realize what's involved in actually trying to accomplish something. You know, uh, if you want to, oh oh oh, he should close down the gay pride masses in San Francisco. Yeah, he should. But good luck with that. Yeah, you know I mean, you know, I mean, what what kind of plan would he need to execute that? Because if you go into it and then you have to back down or you fail, then you're worse off than you were to start with. So you don't want to do that. The armchair quarterbacks never think about that. You know, they think just say something. You yes, know, yeah. <laughs> and that, that that that's not always the wisest course. You know, so. Um, I think it's very important that whatever issues you might have with Archbishop Cordelion, that you thank him now. We should you, everyone go do that. If <laughs> if you're on Twitter, first of all, I'm sorry. But if you are, it was your fault. Go to Twitter, find the latest thing he posted, and write thank you, thank you for being yeah. a good bishop. Yeah, like flood him with thanks. Yes. not just to uh, embolden him. But so that other bishops might see how they get praise. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, a couple of years ago, Bishop Tobin of of uh, Providence, Rhode Island, mm-hmm. did say something about the gay pride thing. Yeah, Do you I saw remember that. that? It was you, great. You, I actually brought attention to it on June first this this month. But but a few it was years, a couple of years ago, yeah. A, f- a few years ago, he did it. Yes, yep, yes. Yep. And people and people just did. Our, our people did not help him enough. You know, I mean, I, I I remember thinking, you know, the bad guys have like a thousand people on his porch. Yeah. Do you remember that they, they had this? They I had don't. this. They had this. Uh, yeah, they they. Yeah, the 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 gay lobby went nuts, of course, you know, yeah. and they had all these people um, yelling at him, and and then and then people said, oh, he backed down. Well, he didn't really back down, you know. He he didn't, and he did it again this year, didn't he? Didn't he? I say don't know it? if he did it again. I hope he bloody did. <clears throat> he should. I thought he did. I thought I saw that. Well, maybe I maybe I mistaken. Sometimes people repost things that took place a couple of years ago. Yeah, because they're yeah, yeah, now, yeah. Maybe I'm mis- maybe I'm mistaken. I I don't. Twit, a tweet. tweet I don't. Twit. I don't. I stay away from. It. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, I don't like it. Yeah. I don't like it. But I have somebody else do my tweets for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not there. They think I'm there, but yeah, it's, it's all a ruse. It's an illusion. Oh, yeah. that's not very honest of you, Matt. Yeah. Well, I, 
I'll bet you click on those things that said, I have read the terms and conditions. Oh, the time. We are going a long time in purgatory for those fibs, man. But you know the one thing I can't do that my wife wishes I would do? What's that? I can't lie if somebody asks me a direct question because I think it's always wrong. And so when I'm asked by my life insurance guys, do you use tobacco products? Yes. My wife in the next room is like, I'm going to kill you. (laughs) But only after you get the less amount of life insurance you should have got if you had have lied, you idiot. (laughs) She doesn't say idiot. but That's funny. Well, what about, uh, what's going on with Father James Martin? What's he doing these days? I don't know. Oh my gosh. What? You, you expect hang out? me to follow You don't him? hang out with him? I don't, no, I not only don't fi- hang out with him, I, I, I don't, I, I don't follow him particularly. I mean, I know he's up to no good, but I don't follow him. I mean, that, that's an Eighth Amendment violation, you know. What is the Eighth Amendment? Cruel and unusual punishment. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Cruel and unusual so it's not enough to be cruel. It has to be cruel weird. And unusual, <laughs> this isn't our constitution, Matt. Okay? This is an American thing. All the Americans know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Cruel and unusual punishment. Did you know that that was the Eighth Amendment? Be honest. Mm, I'd heard it, but I didn't remember. I could not. <laughs> no, no, that's a lawyer thing. Amendment. That's a lawyer thing. That's a lawyer joke that they will say that... Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> I had never heard that heard that either until I was hanging around with lawyers, and then they and then they go, uh, yeah, this is an Eighth Amendment a violation. Oh yeah, cruel and unusual punishment. Anyway, <laughs> well, we we have uh, questions that have come in from our uh, very attractive supporters. Oh yeah, we don't take questions from people who aren't attractive, but just what? by becoming a supporter, you actually become attractive. That's another lie. But let's see if I can find some here. Is that all right? I'm hoping we haven't say yes. we haven't We're offended enough get... people yet by this conversation we've had so far. <laughs> ask ask the people in the live chat. Are you offended? All right, let's see <laughs> here. Now I haven't read these ahead of time, so I can't Uh-oh. can't vouch for them. Je- <laughs> Jennifer Lindler, Linda, Lind, Lind- Lind- Nur, thank you, says, Matt and Dr. Morse, like all of us here, I imagine I just cannot get over the continuing damage that ardent feminists, the LGBT community, the transgender community, etc. are perpetuating on young people. The videos coming out of the drag competition with children are beyond the pale. There's a lot that's beyond the pale. That's one of those things. Yeah. Uh, aside from continuing to speak the truth, point to scripture and be examples of uprightness as much as we can in our own families and communities, how are we going to actually reveal the toxicity of the darkness and turn this around? This culture, if that's what this is, I don't think we live in a culture. This culture is so entrenched in degradation that it does seem impossible. And I find myself often in despair. Love your work, Matt. <laughs> Mother of three. Wait, this is Jennifer? Yeah. Okay. So, hi, Jennifer. What's up? <laughs> um, so, you need to pick out something that you can do that you can actually accomplish. And one place that you can accomplish things. I'm, I'm not familiar with these drag queen competitions, okay? But I am familiar with the drag queen story hours uh, in the libraries. Yeah. I'm, and I'm familiar with the some of the objectionable books that are in libraries, including school libraries. And you need to pick a project with a handful of other dedicated moms and and stick to it like a dog with a bone, that you're going to show up to these events, you're going to do counter-protests, you're going to do something about something. So pick, everyone can do something. None of us can do everything that needs to be done, but everyone can do something. And uh, the Drag Queen stories, Story Hours, they can be resisted. Getting the books out of the library, that can be resisted. And One thing you could do is just go take out all the books of the library. Go to your local library check and them out. check out every gay book you can find. And then never bring them back. Yeah. Yep. Just pay for that. Yep. That'd be a great service. Maybe I'll do that this afternoon. Yeah. Um, and, keep going. And, and I know other people who have, um, in fact, my activists of the year, Matt, have written a couple of books that are suitable for kids uh, on these topics. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things they do is they go to libraries and say, wouldn't you like to have this in your library? OK, so there are a number of things that you that yeah. you can do, even as a, a small group of individuals, you can do something. I mean, look at look at what the the angry parents did in Virginia. They overturned. Basically, they turned around the election for governor. It was the it was those angry parents showing up at school board meetings that made it very clear uh, what the dividing line was. So so mm. I, I understand that you feel overwhelmed, but pick out something and do it. Maya, who is a local supporter, says any advice for married women without kids? Should they work or leave their job if possible? And engage other activities, household, local parish, etc. I 
think that's a matter of discretion. You know, I don't think it's nearly as important if you if you don't have kids or if your kids are are grown and gone. Okay, so that's my story. I mean, mm-hmm. um, I was part time for a long time, and um, and then came back to it when the when the kids left home. But you need to do it in cooperation with your spouse, and um, and considering. All of the circumstances of your of your state and life, you know, um, and what's going to be best for your family. You know, maybe you have grandchildren who need you, or or you have an ailing spouse. You know, you're going to have different. Uh, the, the answer is going to be different in all those circumstances. But, but the, in, con- the concern the seat. concern about about this mom's is working is and different. And she's got you a soda. Oh my Isn't God, she amazing? Got you a pet. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very right. much. All oh, right, well. and you nice are Cameron? You. Yes. Hi, Cameron. Yeah, nice to meet you. I was going to ask uh, Dr. Morse one more question, then I want to make you sit here and talk to her, if that's okay. I would love to. All right. You seem like a nice person. Why not? <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> uh, Jack says, I ask this as someone who is married outside the church. Oh. Should we stop referring to secular legal unions as marriages? I argue that it wasn't recognition of homosexual unions that redefine marriage. It was the notion that the state has as much ability to actualize a marriage as God and the church. What a question. Well, um, I'm, I'm also married. Nice. I'm also um, married to a non-Catholic. And um, but, but the church recognizes the concept of a natural of a, of, a, sure. of a marriage that just and I'm married in the church. I'm married to a non-Catholic, but inside the church. Um, we conceded control of marriage to the state a long time ago in that respect. Um, the issue that troubles me more than, than this question, so, so to, to answer your first question, uh, people who are not married in the church are still validly married and or, or can be can still be. Va- validly married, and the church would recognize that. So if you come to, uh, to, to marry... I think the presumption is that your marriage is valid. If, you, if you, no matter, if it is a valid marriage, it's presumed that it's like if, it, like for example, like if you have a, if I marry my wife outside of the church without a dispensation, right? this is presumably invalid, right? Even though it might be a marriage legally, but if two Protestants get married in their Protestant church That's or right. wherever else. It's presumed to be married. The church, it's the presumed church to be presumes that marriage. to be an actual marriage. The, I think it's the not idea, a sacramental marriage. It's uh, not, it's, no, it would be. If two baptized Christians are married, yeah. two baptized Protestants are married, it's both sacramental and, and valid. But it doesn't have the fullness of the graces. Sure. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but being it, both Christian, but being baptized, that would that would qualify. Right. Them. Right. Right. The baptism is an important point right. in canon law and whatnot. But anyway, the but the one part of what you're saying that I want to affirm that I think is right is that we did give up too much before we got to the gay marriage state. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, the issue was no fault divorce because when we redefined no fault divorce, also redefined marriage, and that's why I favor this terminology. We, the court redefined marriage. Mm. That's what the issue was. They didn't institute so-called gay marriage. They redefined the legal definition of marriage. And no-fault divorce redefined marriage from being a presumably permanent and a presumably exclusive union of a man and a woman. That was humongous. That was a major step. Because as soon as you say it's no longer presumably permanent and there's no such thing as a marital fault, then it's also the case that it's no longer presumably sexually exclusive. Okay, so we lost both permanence and sexual exclusivity with that move. Well, now that's now marriage is something that two men might be interested in. They wouldn't be the slightest bit interested in it if it was for life and you could only get divorced for cause. And if, and if adultery was considered a marital fault, two gay men, trust me, would not be the slightest bit interested in that, okay? It was already because it had been degraded so badly. You know, there's kind of nothing left. or I shouldn't say nothing left, but, it, you know, a lot of its core features had already mm-hmm. been seriously damaged that it became um, prey, you could say. Or is that, that's not the word I'm looking for, but you know what I mean. Well, who's this guy? It's been it? hollowed out. Um, yes, that's a good way of putting it. I forget who asked I that. Heard, but thank you. Thank you for that question, though. It's important. Uh, Paul Ambro, thank you for being a patron, Paul. He says, perhaps it's cynical, but is the way out of this for us faithful Catholics to have more babies, yep. raise them sheltered from this garbage, and let the deviants sterilize themselves? <laughs> <laughs> I'd get along really well with this dude. Uh, oh, eventually, on. we'll Gee, win Paul. out. Uh, and then he says demographically. Problem is, though, I mean, if you're having babies and then feeding to the public schools, you're just feeding well, disciples of the, the thing, Gnostic the death The problem cult. is, I mean, I, I, have, I have tremendous sympathy with this argument, let me say. 
uh, I think that having more babies is a solution to many problems. So let's put it that way. <laughs> but they're not going to leave you alone, Paul. You know, they're not going to leave you alone. In fact, the reason they're so aggressive is because we're winning this war. They don't have kids of their own. They're going to come after yours. They're going to do it. So you, it's not enough to have more babies. You still have to protect them. And you won't be able to completely protect them by doing some kind of Benedict option or something. They're going to come after you. So one way or the other, you got to be prepared to draw a line in the sand and fight. You know. So sorry, uh, you're, you're not being cynical. I hope I'm not being cynical. I hope we're both being realistic here. It's not enough to be merely defensive. Correct. You can't win on defense. Could I say that again? You can't win on defense. Somebody's got to put some points on the board. Yeah. Kyle Whittington says, Dr. What? No, Was that too, 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 no. too, too much of a... <laughs> no, 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 we're fine. <laughs> Dr. Morse, you mentioned junk science, and on that topic, it seems like when those with PhDs are the ones muddying the waters, what chance do normal folks stand in seeking the truth? God help us. What should we do to help prepare our children for this academic pandemonium? pandemonium? Well, you've just got to be discerning about who you trust. I think that's the main thing. Um, and I think it's perfectly okay to trust your common sense. A lot of people learned to do that over COVID, I think. You know, people came to realize that th th these, these things aren't adding up. You, they cascaded too many lies too close together, you know, and, and people can figure out this is, not <clears throat> this is not adding up. And if you use your common sense, well, you know, you have, you have some chance. But you do have to have some people that you trust. And the sad truth is we're losing science. You know, Matt, um, modern man is very proud of his science. You know, we, we gave up religion because we thought we had science and technology. Well, we're losing all that, right? If all we have is, um, if science is whatever the guy with the checkbook says it is, and that's increasingly what we're dealing with here, um, then it's not science, right? So I think a measure of skepticism is important, and then you need to seek out people who attempt to do what we attempt to do in our in our own little area, you know, well, actually, it's a pretty big area, um, uh, you know, to seek out the material that we put together to try to counter some of these uh, false narratives. There's another guy out there that I interviewed on my podcast, and I'm I'm going to blank on his name. It's going to take me a minute to come up with his name. He's we'll got an have, organization. We'll He's got organization an organization <clears throat> um, that is that is concerned with debunking stuff. Um, and I think it might be called Just Facts. I think it's called Just Facts, and I interviewed this guy on my podcast, I don't know, over a year ago now. Um, but he has whole sections, you know, where he goes through and debunks, you know, the current wokester uh, mm -hmm. myth, or mm -hmm. urban myth, whatever it is. I think that's what it's called, Just Facts? Yeah, I think right? it's called Just Facts. Neil? I'm <laughs> But but uh, junk science is a big problem. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, what's interesting is that it's not like they're talking about esoteric, nuanced things that aren't discernible to the naked eye. They're saying obvious false things that it takes right. a PhD to believe. Right. <laughs> if, if I tell you men can become women and it's okay to kill the innocent and you yeah. should have your child's breasts removed, you're an idiot. You are outside of the realm of right. rationality. Right, right. And so it might help you not to have a PhD. And in I, that. I think I think Paul, this is Paul Ambrose. Is that who asked this question? This uh, is. I think I think it's yeah. appropriate sometimes to just say this is I, I, this is so stupid. I don't have to refute it. Go away. Let you know, and that's what itself, we need yeah. to be saying to to Richard Levine, who calls himself Rachel. Mm. Right. <clears throat> you know who I'm talking about. I've heard the name. So this is oh oh this is the guy he. Uh, we are definitely going to get banned from YouTube, which I'm fine with. I just want everyone to remember, mattfrad.locals.com. Go. <laughs> misgender somebody. <laughs> yeah, so this guy, Richard Levine, he calls himself Rachel. He's an assistant something or other oh, the yes. Department of Health and Human Services. Bless or him. Whatever. And they made him an admiral, and he's the first transgender admiral. I mean, yeah. It's just, oh, we deserve it's, to be destroyed as a country. You know, come on. No, 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 no. You, I don't have to believe that. I don't, in fact, I, we made a meme out of this one time. You, said, you can change your name. Changing your name to Rachel doesn't make you a woman any more than changing your name to Daffy makes you a duck. <laughs> but you can legally change your name to Daffy Duck if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't. Yeah. Doesn't make you a duck, though. Right. I want to invite you. Are you okay, Carl, sure, from chatting? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you could. I was thinking of how this could, like, this conversation could start. I, I would love you to tell her. Tell Dr. Morse how you first heard about the theology of the body and how that began began to unravel the false beliefs you had held oh, and were wow. taught. 
And if, as soon as you need to go, just we'll just end abruptly. We'll What's be, that? Whenever you want to go. Oh, I you know don't know. know. Yeah. We promise you we'll get you to the airport on time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, honey. Hello. Hi, So I'm Cameron. coming in super cold because I was at home taking care of kids and not yeah. watching this. So yeah, yeah, just, yeah. So you know, I haven't heard anything up to this point. Yeah. But, okay. Well, okay. I mean, I heard those last two questions, which was right, great. Right, right, right. Well, you've heard since you've been in here. Exactly. You've heard, you've heard yeah. what's going on. But yeah. you, any, anyway, have you ever heard of me before? I haven't. I'm okay. sorry. Okay, I, I'm okay. like, people are always like, oh, so-and-so. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, unless my kids are talking about... People, I don't really keep track of who's who. and Right, yeah. right, right, right. Well, anyway, Matt asked you this question about theology of the body. Sure. So tell me about that. Yeah, so I was raised very much in suburbia, uh, <clears throat> all over the country, actually, but very suburban, typical um, Bostonian Irish Catholic family. So, like, we went to Mass on Sunday when we were in town, but you don't when you're on vacation because Jesus knows you're on vacation. I don't think I was taught what we believed as Catholics. Mm -hmm. um, but we went to, sometimes, depending on where we live, sometimes it was Catholic schools, sometimes it wasn't, but we weren't um, very educated, faithful Catholics. We were more cafeteria Catholics. Mm -hmm. And then when I was um, 18 or 19 years old, I was doing net ministries in Canada, and I was dealing with health issues, and I was really sick, and I just was in a lot of pain at night, and I wasn't sleeping. And so I was like, I'll put on a movie. And so there was VH, I'm going to date myself here, VH. VHS tapes, you know, and so I put one on and it said theology of the body. And I'm like, what's this? And I put it on and there was just like all these naked images of like the Sistine Chapel. Like it was beautiful, but I was like, what in the world is this? I turned it off. I'm like, I don't know who's what. What is this? Like we're supposed to be, you know, <laughs> preaching chastity and these are naked paintings. And I like I was just taken back by it. Um, I think I also through high school, I very much got my worth in um in my body and my looks and oh. like I was kind of kind of trained in a way that like my mom would tell us like girls you're very pretty and my mom would say I was a tomboy so often I wouldn't do my hair or makeup and my mom would be like Cameron if you just did your hair and makeup you could get a guy I'm like <laughs> I don't really care. I don't. <laughs> right, but, right. but I did fall into that where I was definitely looking from uh, attention from guys in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And so kind of had a conversion experience and was more like, OK, guarded. And so the next morning I asked my teammates, I'm like, what the heck? Who's whose videos are these? There's like all these naked paintings of people. And they're like, oh, Father Dale brought it over. I'm like, the priest brought it over? OK. So <laughs> I played it again the next night. Same thing. I'm d up at night. So I play it. I listened to all three VHS tapes. It was probably like, I don't know, six, seven hours all night. And I was livid. I was so angry. And I was like, who the heck is this guy? First of all, it was Christopher West, um, who's a good friend of ours. I love him. He's wonderful. But I was angry at him and I was angry at the church because where was this five years ago when I needed it, when I was in high school and I was, I didn't know that my body was good and beautiful and, um, a gift from God. I didn't know it was a gift from God. No, mm -hmm. no. I thought it was to get a guy to then get married and you know, whatever further my life. Um, but I had no idea. I felt like I had been lied to and robbed and cheated yeah. and cheated mm -hmm. very much cheated. Cause I, um, I was taught to be classy. So you wear something low cut and then something longer or something short and then high cut so like not not trashy you know classy but still revealing way too much skin but like <laughs> like i i very much got confidence from like oh yeah i got everyone in this room to turn their head and notice me you know like that empowered like that's part of being a woman and our mm -hmm. feminine um beauty and mm -hmm. um and so i was really angry because i wasn't taught this yeah 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 may, may i ask I, I revealed earlier on i I'm, i was born in 1953 what year were you born? 81. 81. Okay. And the reason I ask is that I find that women's experience varies a lot yes. by when they were born because yeah. things change so quickly. Yeah. You know? So this was probably in 2000. So I graduated high school in 2000. So this is like 2001, 2002. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So by that time, the sexual revolution's in full swing. But you were in a you were not you were not in a position where you were being promiscuous or something like that. That wasn't part of your story. But there was still this. Use use of the body. Yes, yeah, a yeah. use of the body, and then um, and then I also kind of went from extreme, like public high school, you know, everybody partying all weekend long, whatever happens happens. So like, yeah, and then kind of had like a bit of a conversion experience, and now I'm with Catholics that are 
trying to practice their faith. And yeah. so I'm, I'm in this, but I was just in that more party yeah. scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so there's an anger. And like, if I had known this, then I wouldn't have been doing that. Right. And I knew that I was finding my worth in relationships with guys. And that that really angered me as well. Yeah. And what what was what, what made you so angry about that? I don't know. I think anger is like my notch. Like, I think different people have different emotions that they go to. Mine's always anger. I'm like, I'm really happy and excited. And then I just get angry. I don't know. Um, it's where well, it's our... not an irrational anger. It's a it's something needs to change. And I need to I need to, there's an injustice here that needs to be remedied. You yes. don't get irrationally angry very often. No, no, no. That's fair. And and our daughter's the same. We so have... repeat it. Repeat it. Because I'm not sure. Yeah, that sorry. Got so pick, got picked up. Yeah, on the mic. yeah I'll say it again. So I was saying, yeah. I think your anger is very often a righteous one in which you see an injustice that you believe needs to be remedied. Yes. And it moves you to that action. You're yes. You're very infrequently, I mean, you have been, I think last night at one point, maybe a little bit irrationally angry, but for the most part, <laughs> not, you're not that way. Yeah, no. And, and it's, um, yeah. And I do think that I, like, I keep my cool in it. It's not like I like explode, but right, it's like, right, right. if something's being done, that's not okay to be done. Like I'm going to intervene and be like, mm -hmm. this is what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and I will correct people, especially people that no one else will correct. I will correct them. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I was like the queen of like telling other kids what to do on playgrounds because I'm like, well, listen, their parents aren't correcting them. Listen. And so I go up to a little boy who's like punching people or pushing them and be like, look him in the eye and be like, look at me. You can't do that. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to leave the playground if you keep punching and how old or pulling. Were you when you're doing this? Oh, I did it from the time I was a kid, but yeah, even as yeah. an adult. Right, yeah. Right, right. And I have a daughter who's very much the same way and just more direct. Well, and I think, to, to uh, the, uh, if I can, I think the reason you were angry to get to your question was that there was an injustice that had been yes. done, namely, you were not taught the truth. Yes. Yes, I was not taught the truth, and I wish I had. Because right, if I had right. been taught the truth, I would have behaved much differently. Right, right, right. And this is the downside of people being nice, or okay. thinking they're being nice, right? Mm -hmm. by, by avoiding confrontation, by avoiding dealing with the, with the troublesome issues, this people are being cheated. People yeah. are being cheated out of their birthright. Yeah. yeah. Now, you know, it's funny, you, you talked about... Um, uh, body image. I wondered if you ha had body image is issues because a lot of young women have that, you know, yeah. regardless of what they're doing sexually, you know, they may be being pure, but they, but they have, um, they have the idea that their worth comes from how they look and, yeah, so I, I think part of my, um, so I have a sister that's 14 months older than me and she was, she was homecoming queen, prom queen, voted best looking in the class. Like she was just everything you want your or my parents wanted in a daughter they had in her. And then I was 14 months later and I was the tomboy and I would say stuff that you're not supposed to say. I would act in a way. And so actually I was really big into sports. And so I feel like when I started developing, I got angry. And I was like, this is ridiculous. I got to relearn how to swing the softball bat now. <laughs> and, and so like I, yeah, so I, I think if I was... And so I'm thankful that I was raised when I was, because I think if I was raised now, I would have been convinced that, Cameron, look how much you're not like your sister. Any you're of really your sisters, boy. you're really a boy. You're really a boy. Yeah. And I, yeah. and I yeah. would get angry when I was in second or third grade. I actually, there was a boy that wasn't letting me play soccer. And he said, I'm not going to let you play unless you make me let you play. And I was like, all right. <laughs> Punched him in the face. He got a bloody nose. And I, I took it as an insult. And all my friends are like, oh, you did not call Cameron a girl. I knew I was a girl, but I took it as an, the way he was saying yeah, it was yeah. an insult. Yeah. So I maybe broke his nose and then played soccer for a couple of minutes until I got in trouble. But um, yeah, I took it as an insult. Right. And I thought I wanted to, I could do anything a guy could do, but I could do it better mm -hmm. because I'm a girl. Mm -hmm. But if I was raised today, I think that I would have had multiple therapists, parents, right. everyone be like, Obviously, you identify as a boy. Right, Before right. mass is even over, you're taking your skirt off. I had shorts on underneath. It was modest, I promise. So I can run around and play soccer with all the guys. Yeah, I had a sister who was like that. Oh, you really? Know? Yeah, yeah, who was, you know, she was active in sports all the way into adulthood. She was on a softball mm -hmm. team, you know, corporate corporate softball league and all that kind of thing, you know. And, and you, you know, you really, you look at it and you shudder to think what, you know, yeah. what could happen to these kids today. The one dear friend of mine um, named Erin Brewer, she had this kind of experience. It was it was worse than what you're describing, if, if you don't mind. No, I, please. I'm not sure yeah. where you want to go with this, Matt. No, but let's anyway, go. Let's but go. Yeah, but, but I think I think you'll appreciate this story. So Erin, she and her brother um, 
when she was six years old, she and her brother were accosted by two men, Mm -hmm. and she was sexually assaulted, and her brother was not. So in her little six-year-old mind, she said, I'll be a boy. That will keep me safe. Mm -hmm. And so she tried to... You know, get get her hair cut, and you know, just as a little six year old, just trying to be a boy. And fortunately, there were sensitive people in her life who realized something's wrong. You know, right. it took a while for her to finally talk about the the abuse itself. But there were people who were able to say to her, you know, no, you you don't have to be angry. You don't have to punch people. You you know, you 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 aren't really a boy. You're going to be fine as a girl. And she so now, Erin is an on fire activist on this issue because she's like. If, I, if this had happened today, yeah. I would have been ushered right into this whole path. And where would I be? I would never be a mom today. And, yeah, you know, all right? the wonderful things that I've been able to do as a woman. Because yeah. I am a woman, you yeah. know, and it's okay to be a Praise woman. Praise God. Yeah. yeah or if exactly. someone had approached like, oh, you're getting upset that you're developing in the chest. Take these pills. There's no side effects. We'll just delay puberty. Yeah. Oh, it's so, to- it's so wrong. I would have jumped at it. Yeah. And yeah. I am so thankful that my parents didn't do that with me. I right. don't think it was an option back then, but right. I'm so grateful that they right. didn't. Because in those days, I wasn't really, I wasn't interested in boyfriends. Like eventually I did, but that was more like high school. Right. And it was normally, so I would, I don't know, just be seen and known, right? Mm-hmm. And so it was more that, but it, it came, I was captain of the wrestling team in high school. Like I was... Very tomboy. There was a girls wrestling team? Yeah, there yeah. was. Texas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there oh, was, you grew up in Texas? Uh, I graduated from high school in Texas. Okay. Yeah. Where at? Uh, the Woodlands High School. I know where that is. Oh, do you? Yeah. 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 Uh, Lake Charles is just 30 miles oh, yeah. from the Texas border, you know. So. Oh, very good. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. yeah we lived in Mandeville, Louisiana. So I do the drive across all the oh, time. So. Somebody mentioned that to me. Mandeville. Yeah. Okay. This is adding up now in my, yeah, in my yeah. mind. Yeah. So I, did, I normally say I'm from Texas, Louisiana, but I mm-hmm. moved there when I was um, probably like junior high-ish. Mm-hmm. But you, there was a girls wrestling team and you were captain of the wrestling team. Yeah, That's yeah, but it, That's there was like a very few of us and a lot of guys. And so like we were all together all the time, but we just wrestled the girls because yeah. yeah. girls are top heavy. So anyone out there that is a wrestler, do not wrestle girls. Okay. We, we went to yeah. put our son in wrestling and I was talking to the coach. I'm like, I don't want him wrestling girls. And then someone overheard or whatever. And they're like, are you like anti-girl wrestling? And I was like, no, I'm sorry. I was one of actually the first your ass female right wrestlers in this country <laughs> or anywhere, I'm sure. Um, I'm like, no, I'm very pro, but girls are top heavy. It's not fair. Right. And I'm right. also raising my young son to be a gentleman and not to hurt women. And then it's like, unless you're in the ring, then you pin her. You get her down. Like, yeah, grab no, her around the crotch. Grab her, her yes. Yeah, yeah, No, yeah. you're very... Do you, know, do you know, I have an image that I sometimes use in my PowerPoint slides, and it's an image of a boy... Who uh, who declared himself a girl and who therefore won the girls wrestling match and this is like Not in fair. eighth grade or something like yeah. that and the image is of the referee holding up the guy's arm and the look on the referee's face it's like you know just like. Disgust. Disgust. Just thorough, yeah. thorough disgust. And it's not okay. No, it's not and, okay. And we we had, I, coach didn't want us wrestling with the guys, but sometimes when he wasn't around, we would. Sure. But that 95 pound guy could beat all the girls yeah. up to like the 215. Yeah. Just because of the way his body is built. Right. Right. Like, like, like in wrestling, every pound counts. So in a 95 against like a 165, the 165 should cream them. Right. But that 95 guy. Would win. Versus a girl. Yeah. Yeah, versus yeah. a girl. Yeah. Yeah. But then in our own weight classes, we were pretty much on par with each other. But yeah, yeah. I, I think anybody with their eyes halfway open realizes that trans allowing boys to compete in girls' sports is the end of women's sports. Right? I, I don't understand how anyone how, could say that they're like a feminist or pro women and be okay with this. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. This is abuse so, and but, robbery but from so, us. So this is what this is what something Matt and I talked about earlier, you know, before you before you joined us, is that 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 a lot of these issues they aren't really what they say they are. Okay, right. so really it was never about women's and women in sports. It was always about power. You know, it was mm. always about going around shutting down boys wrestling programs because they're. Too, yeah, yeah, I don't know if you remember this, but this was a thing in the Clinton era. Uh, the Title IX of the Civil Rights Act requires equality in sports for boys and girls, and what they took that to mean was equal numbers of sports, equal numbers of participants, even though. Any idiot knows more boys are interested in sports than girls. So you have as many opportunities as possible. You're not going to get equal numbers. Okay. Yeah. So what they did was they went around and shut down boys wrestling programs and swimming programs. And they invented things for girls. They they turned dance into a sport. 
because girls okay. would be interested in that, right? And so all of that to equality, access, women's sports, you know. Well, so you look back on that and you look Title IX. The same Title IX is now what Obama used to say you have to let people participate in their preferred gender, which is destroying women's sports, right? So it was not about women's sports. It was about power. Was- that is so interesting because I was I was in school right during the Clinton era. I was in school and there was programs like I remember we would do these presidential fitness awards and there was different standards for the girls versus mm-hmm. the boys. But it was like a big thing. And I always like got the blue. I don't know. I think it was like a patch or something. But it was this push for and I and I was one of the first girls on the all boys soccer team. So. That's interesting that yeah. you're that you're saying. I'm like, oh gosh, sorry everyone that I was a part of that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but hey, you know, I... but you as kids, it's not your fault. Oh, you can't right. blame the no, kids, of course. No, you know, no. it's like, what the heck are these adults thinking? Know. You know, they're, they're, and... this uh, this article just came out that I think is apropos of what we were discussing about the sort of power we people can have against the Gnostic death cult. Listen to this. Mayor announces cancellation of drag queen story hour after community backlash. He says, ensure that all voices are represented. Listen to this. A mayor in North Carolina announced Saturday that a proposed LGBT pride drag queen story hour event has been canceled after backlash from the community. I won't continue to read, but that's good news. Yeah, exactly. And that that's happening all over the place. And people need to take heart from that. And you need yes. to get active in it. You need to get active. You need to be part of it. Because the fact is that these things start in the big cities, but the activist care about the books in the library in every little burg in Texas and every little burg in North Carolina. You know, if they aren't there now, they will be there. You know, um, mm-hmm. the, the pro- professions have been corrupted and the, and the activists have their, you know, have their, their push everywhere, you know, and so you need to resist that. So that's great. Thank yeah. you for Maybe sure. we can conclude with a final thought and then if it's okay with you, we'll swap back out unless sure, you have more yeah. you want to talk about. And that's just like how the cultic death Whatever I you, called this the Gnostic death cult. I called the sexual revolution a Gnostic death cult yes. because they are at war with the human body. Yeah, and that's I why Christopher War, Christopher West's stuff and Pope John Paul's stuff is so why that's so important. Yeah, why it's that the was bomb so, to the soul. Yeah, it's, how yeah. so um, prescient on his part, on John Paul's part, to realize yes. that this is what needed to be said. Yeah, and time. and and I think that people are starved for it. So yeah. the joke was after after I experienced the theology of the body. I couldn't, everyone would joke that, like, I go up to anyone at a bar, anyone trying to talk to me, I would start preaching the theology <laughs> of the body. And, and oh, my friend... My, you got to tell him that story about the time you cornered the man from Sex in the City and gave him an earful. Okay, you I don't will. have to. No, 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 I will, story. I will. But Chris, a good friend of mine, she said, she's like, Cameron, I don't understand what happens. Like, one person starts talking to you, and the next thing I know, like, half the guys in the bar are listening to you preach the theology of the body. I'm like, because they're starved for it. Yeah, and yeah. she's like, I think they, like, come to talk to you to be like, oh, this girl's kind of cute. And then they get an earful, and they're like, wow, okay, this is a lot to process. Yeah, but yeah. we just have these conversations, and they were so amazing. And surprisingly <clears throat> fruitful, at least in the moment. And right. I think there is something that someone having a beer in them and they're a little more open to truth. Um, pints, hence the, hence the idea of pints. Exactly. Pints with Aquinas. But yeah, and then I, everyone, everywhere I talked, I did it. I was a youth minister and I used to do these morality and me nights. Oh. And the youth group, the priest was hoping that there used to be like five kids that would come out. And he's like, if you could get it up to 20, that'd be great. These morality and me nights, our building would be packed full. We'd have like 100, 150 teenagers starve wow. for truth, wow. moral truths. Wow. And I had a bucket of shirts because I had a lot of girls that would come and wouldn't be dressed modestly. And I pull them aside and I thank them for coming. There was like a social time of eating pizza, chatting. <laughs> but I pull them aside. And I'm like, hey, listen, I bring them into my office and I'd say, I'm so glad you're here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. In a moment, I'm going to go into that room and I'm going to give a talk. You are a beautiful girl. If you are in there dressed the way you are, none of the guys are going to listen to me. All they're going to notice is how nice your body is. And it, it is very nice. I don't mean to insult it, but I, I would like to give you a gift. I have a present for you. And I had this shirt that I had like got dignity and a question mark. I mean, this is so what, in 90s or whatever, yeah, yeah, the whole yeah. got milk thing. Uh-huh. It's a got dignity. And then there was a Bible verse and it says, I'm a child of God. So I give him a free t-shirt. I'm like, I'd love for you to wear it for the talk. It's yours to keep if you want to keep it. If you don't, you can burn it. If you're angry with me, whatever you want. But I I really want you to stay for the talk if you don't mind putting it on. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I gave away hundreds and hundreds of these shirts. <laughs> and the girls were so beautiful and yeah, yeah. they responded so well because yeah. I wasn't preaching at them. I saw them for who they were. Right. I've right. been in their shoes before. I get it. And here's a gift. And I remember years later, I ran into this one girl that I hadn't seen in a I didn't even recognize her, but she ran up to me and she's like, Cameron, oh my goodness, it's so good to see you. She was in a sorority and she's like, my sorority, all of us got shirts made like yours. We copied it. She just came one night, her senior year. Wow. She pledged in a sorority and she's like, I've been telling the girls about our dignity and our worth. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? That's really beautiful. Like we're so starved for truth. Do you know what? Uh, the, my followers are not all Catholic. They might not know what theology of the body is. Can you just give them? Sure. Yeah, at the risk of. of no, no, no. Uh, yeah. You know, to give, give the short version sure, of yeah, what the, theology of the body is The theology is all about. of the body is the study of God in and through the naked body. So our bodies are made good, right? They're good, they're beautiful, and we see God in and through the naked body, right? So in the beginning, in Genesis, Adam and Eve looked at each other. They did not sin. They didn't grasp at each other. Neither lusted at the other. They just saw, and what they saw was very good. Eve's was beautiful in her full form, right? Her chest was gorgeous that one day would breastfeed his babies, right? Her womb was sacred where their babies would grow, and there was no lust. Like, when sin enters the world, then there's sin, and then we turn and that's when we can potentially use each other. So when we're talking about the theology of the body, it's the study of God in and through the naked body. Yeah. Matt, do you have more to add to that? That's, That'll do. That's that's Yeah, that's story. really good. That's okay, really you want good. me to tell your story? <laughs> sure. Why don't okay. you tell that and then I'll swap Okay, with you. what's his name? Do you know his name? I don't know. The main guy from Sex in the City. Just Look so him you know, up. If you if you're a viewer of ours and you watch uh Sex in the City, uh you're probably trashy. Stop being trashy. <laughs> yes. No, so 100%. This, it's a disgusting show. So I really like this guy in um, in my big fat Greek wedding. It's the same guy that's okay. in Sex and the City. I never saw it. Anyhow, he was at a at a pub that we were at in um, Houston. Was that right, honey? We we're in Houston. Anyhow, it was my friend's birthday, and she like loves this guy. And I was like, I went up to talk to him. I'm like, hey, would you mind just pointing in that direction and waving hi? And he gets fangirls all the time talking to him, right? And, um, and he's like, are you a big fan of the show? And I was like, Oh, to be honest, I loved you in my big fat Greek wedding. I think you're very talented and you're a great actor. John Corbett? I think it's That's his name, John Corbett. Okay. And so I told him, I was like, honestly, I think it's kind of a shame. I think you've kind of lowered your standards that you're on Sex in the City. And he's like, what, you don't like Sex in the City? I'm like, no. No, I think it's trashy and sleazy. <laughs> and he's like, well, have you ever seen it? And I was like, no, because it's trashy and sleazy. <laughs> and he's like, well, maybe if you watched it, you'd like it. I'm like, no, I know my worth and my dignity. And I'd rather hang out with people that know their worth and dignity. And you degrading women on TV doesn't appeal to me. But thank you for your great work you did in, uh, uh, in my big fat Greek wedding. Pat him on the back. Walked off. So, thank you so much. Good Lovely for you. Chatting with you. Yeah, you see, she she will. She'll say anything to anybody. That's cool. That's very cool. She really will. It's yeah. great. I mean, talk about how transgenderism has robbed us of the beauty of tomboys. Yeah, it's true. It's very true. It's and reduced you know, femininity to lipstick and high heels yeah, oh, while denying yeah. the intricacies and nuances of the of female. the body of, of of what it means to be a woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you know? Um, from time to time, people ask me, what do we say? What do we do about this? You know, uh, I, I had one time a, a priest who was trying to figure out what to say to a bunch of third graders because mm -hmm. there was a child who was going to try to change. And, you know, they, the whole it, it was it was a mess for the whole school it was a mess. Um, and I think I think the child eventually left the school. And anyway, mm -hmm. um, so I told him two things. There are two things you say to the kids who say they want to transition. No, no to the whole to all the kids. OK, you to all the kids, you say. No one is born in the wrong body. Mm -hmm. No one is born in the wrong body. God doesn't make mistakes like that. Nobody's born in the wrong body. And the second thing you say to them, there are lots of ways to be a girl. There are lots of ways to be a boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's okay to be a boy the way you want to be a boy, to be a girl the way you want to be a girl. Yeah. It's okay. You know, yeah. that's the, oh, kind of that's the... That's really great. Um, inoculation, you might say, uh, against some of the crazy. And I suppose that would be your advice to parents yes. who have children who are being indoctrinated by yes. this stuff. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. Uh, Scott Berg says, how did, how do we deal with friends who have kids that are claiming to be transgender and the parents are determined to allow their teenager to go through with it and expect everybody to call the child by their incorrect name 
and accept their choices. Well, it depends. Do you do you feel like the the energy from this thing is coming from the parents or coming from the child? You know, that's um, that's an important discernment for you um, to try to figure out because it, it, I've seen it go either way. You know, I've seen sometimes the parents are enthused and driving the ship, and sometimes it's the child. And oftentimes there is in the background, if it's the child, <clears throat> oftentimes in the background there is a, a peer group. You know, and so there's a certain amount of peer pressure and desire to belong and to fit in and so on. It's going on. So how you deal with it, I, I would I would encourage you to try to be sensitive to those aspects of it. OK, so if you in, in some cases, I'm aware that uh, parents are in agony because they cannot talk to anyone. They feel that if they do, unless they affirm, 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 affirm what their child wants to do, they're going to lose their child. Um, CPS is going to take the child away and so on and so forth. If you've got that situation going on, which it doesn't sound like from the question, that's what he's talking about. But um, I would encourage you to be as affirming and supporting of those parents as you can, you know, if that's if that's what's going on. Um, in the case where the parents are um, not really on board but think they're helping by going along with it, that I think is the place where you can have the most positive impact. Um, because that's when you can quietly talk to the parent, not in the presence of the children. You know, let the, the whatever's going on with the kids, you know, leave that aside. But to say to your peer, that's your peer group now, parent to parent, um, you know, look, you may be hearing that if you don't affirm your child, they'll commit suicide. That is objectively false. That is not true. That is a kind of emotional blackmail. So I want you to to know that I know that. And, um, you know, that I, I, I'll support you if you try to back away from this, if you're going to try to steer your kids away from it. Now, if you've got a parent who's demanding publicly that everybody go along with it, you may end up having to sever that relationship because you don't want to go along with it. You know, you really don't want to go along with it. So that, you know, without knowing all the details of the situation, I hope that provides some guidance for people. We should never lie to people, but people can change their names and do change their yes. names. Yes. So is there a distinction that needs to be made there? Maybe I call you by this new name you've yes. decided to go by while letting you know that I can't go along with the other thing, or do you just call them by their old yeah. name? Yes, I, I don't have a lot of personal experience with this, which, which um, so what I'm about to say may be kind of awkward, <clears throat> but I think it is what you just said I agree with. You know, you can legally change your name to anything you want. <clears throat> Goodness. You can change your name legally to anything that you want. Um, so you can, without um, without necessarily doing anything wrong, call them by the new name. But you mustn't use the wrong pronouns. You've got to you've got to draw the line on the pronouns. Okay? I think there's an analogy here to an invalid marriage. If somebody invites me to attend their invalid marriage, let's say they say I'd like you to be my best man, but it's an invalid marriage. Uh, because, say, the groom's Catholic or something and hasn't got the appropriate dispensation or what have you. My going there uh, sends a message, and I don't want to do that. And so I might say, this is, I think, permissible to say, listen, I can't go as your best man because I don't want to let it be seen or I don't want people to think that I agree with you that this is what you're saying it is. But there might be an instance where you do attend a wedding that isn't a marriage. Um, but I think it's important that you make it clear how you feel. Mm -hmm. you, if you're going to attend, you've got to make it clear how you feel, even if you're in the background of this of this wedding. And I think I could see something similar be the case. If I have a cousin or a brother or whatever that's quote unquote transitioning, of course, transitioning is impossible, but I think I would say, I love you. And I would explain why it is that you can't become a woman or vice versa. I'm willing to call you by your name, this new name that you're coming up with, but I need you to know. You know what I'm saying? Otherwise, mm -hmm. I fear that you're bearing false witness in mm -hmm. a sense. Pe you know, um, I, I've talked to a few people who have taken the trip and come back, um, hmm. uh, and not only with this issue, but also with homosexuality. Um, and one of the things that they'll say is that my mom never gave up on me. My mom never stopped praying for me. Um, I always knew my mom loved me, you know, without going along with my hmm. BS. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. just to put it bluntly, um, I've heard that from any number of people. So there, it's it's a complicated path. It's not a soundbite path. It's yeah. a it's a it's a path of actual engagement with a human person, 
And a lot of what happens to us in the whole sexual revolution propaganda mill, you know, is that we be is that we're given sound bites, we're given labels for people, and that controls our thought, you know. So you either affirm a hundred percent or you're a hater. Okay, well that's not how normal people behave towards each other at all, ever, right? <laughs> right. I mean, you know, that's just not how you do it. And so to to transcend those labels, I think particularly if you are trying to maintain a relationship with somebody, you've got to take the time that allows you the time to say, this is what I really feel, this is what I'm really about, and here, here's here's what I believe to be true about you. You have great dignity as a person. I'm heartbroken that you think you need to do this to your body. I'm sad that you think you need to do this type of sexual activity. I don't think it's going to give you what you're looking for, but I want to stay engaged with you. And the person didn't ask this, but I'm going to say it because I think it's an important situation a lot more people are going to be coming up with. If there's a child involved, if, if you've got a, a, a relative or friend in a same-sex union and they decide to become parents, okay, they're going to do that through some form of donor, uh, you know, don't, gamete donor, sperm, egg, something. They're going to be doing that. That means that child is going to have issues. Okay, it's just a fact. That child is going to have issues. If you can, in good conscience, stay close to the family, you may be the person who can help them five years from now. Because trust me, when people enter into this stuff, like Dave Rubin with his new babies, okay, they're all excited. They don't realize these babies are going to grow up. These babies are going to walk and talk and have thoughts of their own, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're not looking that far down the road because no parent really can. You mm -hmm. know, when you become a parent your life really totally changes and you don't really know what's on the other side of that divide. So you may be the person, if you can stay in relationship, you may be the person who can be available when the questions start or the problems start or the issues come up, you know, that the dads aren't going to know how to answer. The cliches aren't going to work five years from now. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's do a final <laughs> question here because we do want to get you back to the yeah. you got to put on this conference, you know. Uh, let's see. Nurse Life, who is a local supporter. And again, I want to say sorry to everybody who sent in questions that we didn't get to. Some of the questions that were asked have already been addressed, and it's also just not possible to get through all of them. So hopefully you'll understand that. Nurse Life says, academic clinician here. Many pro-transgender scientists receive federal funding from NIH for their research and salary and that money ultimately facilitates their work as activist educators of nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, etc. Shan't we organize, shan't, nice job, shan't we organize to lobby politicians to reform the NIH and make this more difficult for my whack job colleagues? <laughs> <laughs> um, nurse life, you sound like my type of person. You should totally come to our summit. <laughs> because actually last year's summit, the, one of the things we talked about was the corruption in the professions. That was the whole theme last year. Now, it's not going to be so much the theme this year, but <clears throat> but medicine has been completely corrupted. Scientific research, completely corrupted. This is exactly what she's saying here is exactly correct. And it's been going on a long time. I interviewed a guy uh, on the abortion breast cancer link. That guy was canceled. He lost two jobs in the 1990s. That's how long this has been going on, right? And he, he literally had colleagues say to him, uh, you know, look, I agree with you. I know that what you're saying is true, but these people write the checks for my grants. So, no, I'm not going to say anything. So the corruption is enormous. And you're correct that it would be great to try to lobby these um, to reform the NIH. But that's a big bite. That's that's taking off a very big bite. Uh, the federal government is very hard to reform because it's so deeply entrenched. Right. And you saw how people reacted around COVID and how scared people were and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's an enormous amount of corruption within the public health establishment. And that's part of what you're seeing here. So um, an alternative approach is that we need to um, have alternative professional organizations. There are several. I'm not sure what would be appropriate to this particular person, but there's, for instance, the American College of Pediatricians that is an alternative to the mainstream one. There's the Catholic Medical Association, alternative to the mainstream one, and so on. <clears throat> but she's totally correct. It happens all the time. 
uh, have no doubt at all that, uh, that, that, that what she's saying is true. Final question. I know that there's <clears throat> hope in the life to come, but is there hope in America within the next 100 years and why? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think there's hope within 100 years. Um, but there's no But it, it depends entirely on what we choose to do and not do. Right. If we coast, then there's no hope. All right. But if everybody watching this program makes it, uh, it makes a point in their mind, I am going to do something. And if you can't figure out what to do, come to our summit, come hang around our website. You know, we'll give you something to do. Um, but if everybody decides I'm going to do something, no matter how small, it will add up and we can make a difference. And that's my challenge to you. Oh, amen. Well, you have a summit coming up for those who are just joining us. Summit uh summit for survivors.org there's a link in the description below if you live in the louisiana texas area click that link go to the actual summit if you are too far away it's also a virtual summit so you can sign up and watch this excellent content uh, you can also check out ruth institute we've got links to there, links to your youtube channel and to your fabulous book when did this book come out when did it come out yeah 2018 the sexual state how elite ideologies are destroying lives and why the church, church was, was right, right all, all along. along. So it, go check that out. Thank you for being here. That was a blast. Thanks for having me. Indeed. Yeah.